Hello. <laughs> so, um, you join me today in Steve's kitchen, and I've got Miriam Lancewood, the author and adventurer. And if you have any questions today, Michelle is actually on the back end here, so she'll be able to answer your questions. Throw the questions across to us, if anyone has any questions. And we're probably going to have a... Cheers. We're going to have a glass. And we're probably going to have a... Cheers. We're going to have a glass of red wine to enjoy. So if anyone wants to join us, chin chin. How do you say in Dutch? Chin chin. Cheers. <laughs> cheers. Yeah. Prost. 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 Yeah. So prost. Is there anybody in yet? No. no. So we wait a little while, see if we can get some people coming in. So basically, you're watching this a little bit later on. The reason I'm asking is because Miriam, you might notice her accent shortly. She has slightly, very slight Dutch accent. Slight, slight. <laughs> and, slight Dutch uh, and slight Kiwi. Slight Kiwi, because she's a New Zealand... Slight Kiwi, I know. New Zealand Dutch <laughs> yeah. lady. And we're going to get into a little bit talking in a moment as to why about Miriam and why this beautiful book here on the background of a lady in a... Um, Possum skin jacket. <laughs> Got to show the book. Shameless promotion. That's right. It's called Woman in the Wilderness. And we're also going to cook some cookies. So if you want to do some cooking with us, you're going to need some self-raising flour, 100 grams. And we're making these cookies with actually um, coconut flour. So it just to give them a little bit of a, an unusual flavour. So we're going to be using coconut flour. We need some butter, a little bit of sugar for sweetener, any sugar you like. We'll be using the brown sugar. And if you don't have self-raising flour, you're going to need some baking powder, just a little leavening agent to, to raise the cookies. So we're going to be making those in a minute, a minute just to sort of, um, because I know Miriam likes cookies. Yes, because that's the one thing we never have. Because you see, we're living in the wilderness. Yeah. <laughs> so, never have anything but so never have anything. Rice She's just eating goats. mung beans and goats for... Goats, possums. Possums. Well, yeah. 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 Anything wild. So does anybody in the shop? Two. Three. Is it early morning where you are? What time is it where you are? Let me just turn that camera just a tiny bit. Michelle, do you see it slightly a little bit off? Can we turn it just this way a little bit further? This way? Yeah. Turning? Yeah, just loosen that bottom screw. There's one just above your hand. Yeah, that one just there. That's fine. That's, fine. that's it? Yeah, that's a little bit better. Come on, say good morning. Somebody out there, say hello. I want to get this party started and talk uh, to see who's out there. How many people do you expect this morning to join us? I don't know. It depends. If it's people in Australia, it'll be the evening time, so they might join us for a drink. If it's people in Europe, what time is it in Europe? In Europe, it is 11 a.m. in London. Yeah. So Morning time on a Sunday. And it's early morning um, in the US and it's late evening here in Australia. And if you're watching from somewhere else in the world, you'll have to tell us what time it is where you are. Oh, by the way, is the sound working? Are you getting, is the sound okay? <laughs> so I'm going to wait to see if, if any of the, the regulars come in and say hello. Just type hello, check whether the sound is working okay, let Michelle know it's working. It's a long time since I've done a live show on YouTube, so I'm not going to kick it into it. If you if you're watching this later, you'll be able to answer, ask questions there, and I will, as I always do, keep a lookout of the comments and answer them here, here on. So, good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Speak to me, otherwise I'm going to stop. If any of you are lurking in there and you're not going to say hello, then we're just going to stop and go and sulk in a corner, aren't we? Yeah, go to bed. Go to bed, because it's late. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll wait. We'll wait and, um, until someone comes up and ask some questions. We will be Because patient. I'm not every day in Melbourne, and Steve is not cooking every day cookies. No. And um, Now, if you haven't heard of Miriam before, which many of you may not have done, and where have you been living? Under a rock. <laughs> You've been living under a rock. <laughs> under one. Yeah, literally, almost. Over a rock. Not under a rock, but like overhead, you know, sleeping underneath. Yeah. So, Miriam, 
and her partner, her husband, Peter, have been living in the wilderness for seven years in New Zealand. And pretty much you walked out into the, with a backpack and some dried food and just started living out in the bush. And you started to, thought you might try it for several months, but it turned out to be several years, right? Yes, almost 10 years now. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not going to tell you the whole story because I really want people to ask questions today and see whether we can sort of like, um, if, if you actually put Miriam Lancewood into Google, you'll see some pictures. And if you put it into YouTube, you can watch some videos, but don't watch them now. Who's that coming, Michelle? <laughs> Nobody on my side. <laughs> Just type type uh, some questions because I did see questions pop up there, but it's not coming up on Michelle's computer just yet. There may be a little bit of a, a lag. Shall I come around and say hello? Right, come around. <laughs> so for some more intimate experience. <laughs> Hi guys. Greetings, so this is a ph uh, photographic author. Greetings from Columbus, Georgia, 7 a.m. Yeah, I'm so sorry to get you up so early in the morning. How are you all? Come on, there's eight of you in there now. Somebody's got to say good morning, otherwise I'm gonna shut up and go home and cry. Jahid Khan, how are you? Good to have you in. Hi, Harold, good morning. Now I'm hoping the chats, the chats need to come through to Michelle over there so she can ask, because if I stand here like this, talking to you really close and Miriam's back there. <laughs> oh, they're coming through now, it's all good. Harold oh, Finch says hello. There's 10 people. So I'd like oh, to get some feedback from you all as to what you think. Have you ever considered just packing up your bags? Because I know Michelle and I often have thought about this, just putting a backpack on your back and saying, to hell with everything, let's just get out and leave and live in the wilderness. Because Miriam actually has a book called A Woman in the Wilderness, and her and her partner Peter uh, did go and live in the most extreme um, sort of outback of New Zealand, up in the mountains. Yep, up in the mountains. We start out a thousand meters higher, so it's a lot colder yeah. than sea level. Thousand, every thousand meters, six degrees colder. Is it? Yeah. So how many thousand were you up? Well, only one thousand. But <laughs> <laughs> it was still quite a lot of colder. Look, trust and me, it's cold. It's already. cold anyway, right? In in the winter in New Zealand, it's it's cold in the South Island. Well, I don't, in the top in Northland, it's, it's sort of slightly warmer, but so uh, in the mountain, it's really um, really cold. Yeah. Really quite cold. I mean, six degrees Celsius we're talking about, not Fahrenheit. So yeah, it's, Celsius. Yeah. Six degrees so colder than, than sea level. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because <laughs> a lot of the Americans that watch this would be talking in Fahrenheit. So oh, yeah. do you know what temperatures it was in uh, Fahrenheit? No idea. No, not but what temperature? What, what winter? Oh, it oh, must be absolutely freezing. The waterfalls so, were frozen. It was absolutely. So the actual everything water was frozen. Was yeah. ice. It's ice underneath all the trickling water, but so frozen water have got to be cold. It's, you imagine, right? I mean, to be honest, if I was going out to live in the wilderness, I'd choose somewhere a little bit warmer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But in New Zealand, you don't find wilderness when it's warmer because all those warm areas are uh, urban. Yeah, everybody's yeah. living in the, the, the nice sunny climates. Yes, and you can live in the outback in Australia, but yeah. you live in New Zealand. So, so Jelly Duck 100 says, hello, Steve. Hello, everybody on the chat. Hey, Jelly Duck, how are you? You've been good? Behaving yourself? Um, <laughs> the zero degrees is in Celsius is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So, oh, 32. okay, so it was below 30 degrees, below, yes. I mean, yeah. below freezing. Yeah. Even in France, we used to get minus 11 Celsius, so, yeah. so it would have been at least you know, that cold. If you were getting frozen waterfalls, not very cool. Uh, so, we said on awesome, so it's quite straight away and had this frozen weather on falling yeah. waters. So, I mean, this was not done either for any publicity, really. You were just doing it to change yeah, your lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, in many ways, you and Peter are both quite quiet, reclusive characters. I don't think you particularly like the limelight. Like, you, you didn't do it for... Oh, no, not at all. I never thought of writing a book. So after eight years in New Zealand, the publisher asked me to write a book. So actually, a publisher came to you and said, write a book. And you said, I, I, I don't really write I don't write <laughs> He said, well, give it a go. And then she was surprised. So it's become actually a, a, a bestseller book as well. I mean, the, the book about 
the woman in the wilderness. Does this? The, I haven't read the book yet, so I'm a really good host. Really good yeah. host. You know, in preparation, if I was normal, I would read the book through and ask Miriam questions about. We've been talking so much. Yeah. But we've talked. Yeah, we've so. we've spoken so much. But you know, it's it's a fascinating story because we met um, Miriam and Peter and out back in Australia. We were actually uh, up in the northern territories, northern uh, western Australia, and we met them there and we were so we got a lot of this background story and Miriam is down here in Melbourne at the moment because she was doing a presentation like a book presentation yeah I saw a speech yeah and I mentioned a book <laughs> uh, it was only 20 minutes but there were only four speakers yeah but it was a really big audience in the um, convention what? center 1300 people Michelle and I were lucky enough to go along to this so it's 1200 people it's a big audience big auditorium and there were people, all the speakers at this uh, auditorium were um, talking about living in the wild, not living in the wilderness, but existing with the wild and things. And you were the only one, I think, that really lived for any length Well, the time. theme was embracing the wild. Embracing the wild. And so everyone got a different version of that, I guess. And who were the people that promoted this? Who, what was the, who were the people that, that put this on? For the, the School of Life. And it will be repeated in, on Tuesday in Sydney. So for those of you that don't know, School of Life, I think, is... Um, um, a, uh, the, a group of people, or they they promote this sort of, of organization. Yeah, this sort of lifestyle, uh, yeah, alternative lifestyles and things. Yeah. So, any questions? Yeah, Tim Fletcher says hi um, numerous times. He's hey Tim, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we will get we will get yeah. to you. If, I didn't want to interrupt them. They were on the flow. We're on the flow. We're actually we are neither one of us are big drinkers. So because right. we. So um, this will be an interesting experience. So we're gonna, what will I be like after this glass? Because I'll be drunk immediately. She'll be swinging. Drink. We haven't got any chandeliers, but if yeah. she was... You'll be laughing increasingly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to have a little bit of red wine. <laughs> I won't tell you the story about the red wine. It's quite expensive, this wine, wasn't it? Yeah, it was quite an um, expense. Well, not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... We're going to have ourselves a little bit of wine. We're neither one of us particularly big drinkers, so if we get a little bit slurry, uh, yeah, please forgive wine. us. But also, in a moment, I'm going to get Miriam to help me make some cookies. Because uh, she's a very... Uh, I mean, you most of your cooking for the last seven or eight years have been out in the bush, really. It's been cooking on campfire, yeah? Yeah, I think we got, sometimes we've got a camp oven. Yeah. And then make bread, yeah. like you do sometimes. Yeah. And, um, but if you can't carry the camp oven, because it's a heavy thing. We've actually, we've actually got a, a film coming onto the channel maybe in the next 10 days, which I'm editing at the moment, which it will show the, where we were cooking in the wilderness. Yeah, where we met, yeah. So, um, Miriam is actually the hunter. She's the, she's the, in the partnership you have Peter and Miriam, I think they're very much a, a symbiotic relationship. Correct, I think. I mean, yeah. you, know, you sort of both get involved, but Peter became the cook, the, the cooking, and you took up the role of hunter gatherer. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I started off with a bow and arrow, it was very difficult. Later, I got a rifle, but I did hunting. And you have to remember <laughs> that when Miriam started, I'm not going to do the usual asking you questions because I do know the answers, so I'm going to sort of. Yeah, you tell the story. I have some more wine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say, Tim Fletcher says, I'm a massive fan, I use your recipes all the time. Thank you, Tim. Tim, um, so Miriam um, actually was a vegetarian before she went out into the wilderness and then she found because they weren't getting quite enough nourishment from the berries and nuts and things that were available in the wild, they had to start supplementing their food yeah, with quite quickly, really. meat protein. Because <laughs> there's not too much berries to be found. Because you're losing weight, right? You're yeah. completely starving almost. <laughs> You did. <laughs> no, it wasn't that bad, but you know, we're hungry. No, we're getting that. hungry for me. Yeah. So they, so Miriam had to adjust from being a vegetarian to being a carnivore, but a respectful carnivore in so much. And I say respectful because we both kept animal, or we both butchered our own animals in the past, and, mm -hmm. and you started then having to actually capture and eat possums. I mean, it was the, yeah. it was the first meal you had, I think the first meat that you had in the wild was yeah. possums. So people in America might not know what a possum is, but it's a bit like a raccoon. Well, it's here's a possum. 
It's very cute, <laughs> little soft, beautiful not animal, and she took it and cut its throat. <laughs> <laughs> Possum is like a dog one got a tail. Yeah, possums are actually like a rodent. They're they're actually they are quite a cute animal, but here they got teeth like a rodent. Yeah, but they got a little pouch like a kangaroo. Yeah, yeah. they got the little Joey in the pouch. I think cute. you you have possums. I think they have possums in the US as well. I think raccoons. Yeah, yeah. So um, the first meat that you you started to eat was possum. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, I didn't know what it would taste like because I never ate meat. And uh, most people don't like possums, but I, yeah, I thought this was it, you know, this one, me taste on. Ah, yeah, so because I quite liked it. frequently people say, what does, you know, kangaroo taste like, what does this taste like, and everybody says it tastes like chicken, but Miriam didn't have a sort of... Tastes like chicken. Yeah. No, you, you because could, it doesn't taste like chicken. Yeah, <laughs> no, but you didn't have that sort of um, comparison point, no, really, yeah, because you sure. were vegetarian yeah, all your childhood. Yeah, it's much easier. Yeah. So Scarlett Poppyfield says, a possum is a marsupial. It is a marsupial, Scarlet. It's uh, a marsupial, and I think I always tend to think of possums being indigenous to Australia. They're not indigenous to New Zealand, right? They're uh... yeah. So they're introduced from Australia for the fur, and so they they didn't have any um, predators, so they quickly became a pest like all the others. Okay, I'm coming round to show you this beautiful jacket because not only did um, did they respectfully um, eat the possums they caught and use every part of the animal but uh, in the book uh, a woman in the wilderness you can see in the front here that miriam has actually made a jacket out of the possum fur so i think how many possums would you say to make a jacket like this jacket these are just little pieces but um a jacket would take five five possums or so yeah so so they made uh, not only, so I'm covering you there, and you're over there. Uh, they not only made jackets, but you also made some bedding and, and... A duvet and a mat from the possum tails, and it's super warm. Yeah. And th they had to do this because they were living quite often many hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of miles away from many forms of civilization. So I'm coming back around. So Scarlett Poppyfield says, impressive fest, I love it. Yeah, yes. and super warm. So you think people like in the old days, like 500 years ago, they would feel uncomfortable in, in because they didn't have all the modern gear, but no, they would be super comfortable in their furs. Yeah. And they would think, wow, it's so uncomfortable, that plastic clothing and yeah, yeah. cold cotton. And, Cotton's yeah. not necessarily good. Yeah. I mean, although layers of clothing can be quite good, cotton and that is not as good as wearing, say, sheep's furs or yeah. animal furs. Of course, we talk about cold climates here. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't want that fur in the mm -hmm. in the desert in Australia. No, although when we had when our children were younger, the babies they used to uh, when we had very small babies, um, we were sent uh, a sheepskin from a friend of ours in New Zealand, oh, no. and they said, "Oh, you know, a sheepskin and a very thick, uh, furry sheepskin." And they said, and "We were living in a." Uh, um, uh, And they said it's really good to put the babies on when it's too hot. Oh, okay. So yeah. because yeah. They're, they're, works both ways. Yeah, it works both ways. So it was great for the hot weather and great for the the cool weather. Yeah. But you wouldn't want to wear it. It would be for not. It would be safe. So much insulation. Yeah. So, so. Tim Fletcher is asking what you're making. Is it vegetable? It is. We're going <laughs> to be we're going to be using Tim some uh, coconut flour which basically is a ground coconut meal and we're going to make some cookies, just some nice sweet cookies very simple to make, it's not going to be too complicated if you want to join us, if you've got, you don't need coconut flour, if you've got a, a little bit of all-purpose flour a little bit of sugar maybe and you could use some oatmeal or uh, um, any flour really but you need about 100 grams of all-purpose flour, 100 grams of oatmeal or coconut flour if you use, about 100 grams of butter. Yes. So the same in of, of butter or a fat, you could even use uh, um, coconut oil for this, it would work quite well. Yeah. And uh, a, some sugar to sweeten some and also fat, to, yes. the sugar not only sweetens but it also sets the biscuit so it makes it hard because when sugar heats above a certain temperature it, it becomes a, a caramel and then it goes to hard crack and sets and that's why you get hard cookies. So CW Fletch says, hey Steve, how is it going? And Scarlet Poppyfield says, I use sheepskins too and a feather bed. 
Feather bag. Oh, feather. Yeah, like um. Feather on the bottom or a feather duvet, like a duna. Duvet, I would say. Yeah, it's a yeah. mix of feathers and duvet yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's super nice. Yeah. Is the sound okay? Everybody's. Uh, I'll get you to maybe somebody to give us a sound check because we you we are actually doing a live show just from a phone today so we're not using the computer so we've got a microphone over there and we're just we're just hopefully it's going to be um cool enough it should be quite good i've got a really nice microphone well they're answering your questions because tim is asking can it be any sugar it um, can be any sugar but it's it's ideally a natural like a cane sugar or or some some sugars don't set so if you use something like a stevia substitute or something like that it will still add sweetness, but it won't add crispness because you don't. It doesn't caramelize well. So I would suggest you use either white sugar, or cane sugar, brown sugar. Um, He's going to go and find some in the shops. Okay. Scarlett Coffeefield says it's a feather duvet, and the sound is great. And Peakerhead says sounds all right. Good, <laughs> good. Because we we've got a new microphone actually on the phone itself. The phone itself which is a, let's show you the picture. We've got a, a great big tripod, tiny little phone on top, and this huge, great big muff of a microphone. <laughs> looks like a possum. <laughs> looks like a possum. <laughs> great. Don't get your bow, bow and arrow out. So when... And Scar sorry, Scarlett wants to know, can she use honey? Yes, you could use honey. It, it will be a little bit of a softer cookie if you use honey because it doesn't, uh, Chris, it doesn't set the same way, but it actually does still set. So you could use honey, no problem, or syrup, or 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 any um, uh, what's the Canadian uh, maple, maple syrup, syrup would be nice also. Um, molasses even if you want a really dark sort of like a like a like the pfeffernus, you know the the rich dark yeah. cookies. So will the people watching they will also be cooking at the same time? Some will, some will. Wow, that's fantastic! So all eating the same cookies in an, in, in an hour time. In a, in about uh, however long it's gonna take. Um, once we've made it, it will. The cooking time is quite short. It'll be about maybe 14, 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it won't take long. So we won't start right away. Steve, now, uh, just one more. CW Fletch says, Steve, mate, what are you drinking? Uh, we just are drinking. Wine. Cheers. Chin chin. Prost. Prost. Red wine. And we are both getting drunk very quickly. Yeah. We'll be falling over. I do not advocate particularly drinking but because I'm not a big drinker sometimes I won't have any alcohol for many months at a time but um, uh, when Miriam came to visit us today she bought a, a lovely bottle of wine so I said let's have a let's have a glass of wine and sit and chat with you guys and and uh, it's a good opportunity for us to talk a little bit about food but I really want to get some more questions about how Miriam and Peter if you google by the way I would like some of you to just go to google now if you can still stay watching the show at the same time. Um, and put Miriam Lancewood, L-A-N-C-E-W-O-O-D, so Lancewood. Um, Miriam is M-I-R-I-A-M. -I -I and you will see some beautiful pictures. You will also be able to see some videos, um, but don't watch those just yet, because I want you to stay here. But you'll be able to see uh, a little bit about because there's been a lot of media coverage for you guys. I, when you Google it, you get yep. newspaper articles. And that's, uh, yeah. So radio. since the book came out, we had a lot of television coming. They're all interested to film us yeah. in the bush and interviews and yeah. Yeah. So it's been really interesting. It's like media studies. Yeah. And M Miriam, I think, is often a, a, a focus point of the interest because she's quite impressive with a bow and arrow. She's out there like some sort of Amazonian lady with a yeah. bow and arrow shooting um, animals. And if you see Peter also, a very handsome man, very, well, very. good looking guy. <laughs> yes. Probably not as good looking as me, I think. No, no. I mean, there are different. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a very handsome man. So they could make a lovely couple. So they're very, um, but they're very down to a very, very, the sort of people most of you would, would really enjoy to sit and chat with. And so, as I said to you, Miriam left to go into the wilderness of vegetarian, and then she became a hunter. And you started not with a gun, you started with... Bow and arrow. Yeah. Because I really like, you know, Robin Hood, and I was 
as a kid, I thought, oh, you know, bone and arrow is always practicing with my little homemade bone and arrow. So um, that I thought was a very sort of romantic idea. And I practiced on a tiger in the garden before we set out in the wilderness. Mm. That went really well, and I thought, oh, well, pretty easy. I'm good. I've got my, <laughs> I've got my eye in. I yeah. can kill anything. Chung, chung, chung. Yeah, great. So hunting can't be that difficult, because I know what I should, I thought. But it took me about two years to really become good at hunting. Yeah. Not to be underestimated. Well, I think if any any people have ever been in hunting at all, you you know, when you're practicing in the garden, the target's still. But when you, you're out there trying to hunt an animal, it's a very different... It could be walking. Preferably yeah. not, though. Mm. But you could be up high, you could be far away, close away. Mm. One time I saw a goat and was right, and I sneaked close, and there was a little bush here, and mm. the goat was right here. Mm. Only two meters away, I could have sort of stabbed it almost. But I got with my, uh, draw my gun, uh, draw my bow, and I used the normal, um, my normal sight, yeah. which was 10 meters. So I shot over the goat, <laughs> the goat like that. So, mm. no, I know a lot of people maybe who watch this they may not be comfortable with hunting and killing but you you know i think sometimes if you eat meat if you're not a vegetarian it's a good thing to to be respectful and understand the killing process oh yeah if you eat meat then you have to come to terms to uh, what the reality of is of eating meat you know for every piece of meat that you eat some animal did die you yeah. know and i think we've talked about this before so um when you actually do um have to kill your own meat or, or your own animals or wild animals mm -hmm. there's a certain so almost a, a, a I can't explain it it's uh, can you explain this reverence for the animal uh, respect? yeah great respect for the animal yeah. yeah but it's also an amazing thing and also amazing to then eat it and you really feel that um, you know you get something from that especially wild meat or good meat that you grow in yourself and that you don't want to look I'm, I'm talking to Miriam almost as if I understand what she's talking about and we do because we actually used to have our own farm and we kept our own animals and killed so so forgive me if sometimes I don't ask the right questions but you don't waste it either right you don't waste the meat because no, you don't think no. oh can't be bothered with that and I'll no, throw no. that bit away because yeah. not because you don't want to waste the meat but it's disrespectful it's like yeah. saying to that animal your, your life was... You died for nothing. Yeah. 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 So uh, the first thing we eat is heart, liver and kidneys mm. when, we, um, when we get a fresh kill. Because, you know, that's very healthy, I believe. Well, it's full of uh, good uh, minerals and yeah, iron. Yeah. And so that's also the thing you can fry up very quickly. It takes only <clears throat> five minutes to, to fry it up. Yeah. And then we use the rest of the meat for curries and stews. And, yeah. yeah. And you get to understand also which cuts of meat can be used for different yeah. purposes because some meats are much more, some parts of the <coughs> meat are much more tender, some are tougher. Yeah. Yeah. So your shoulder meats tend to be a lot tougher, need slower cooking, your loins and your, uh, um, your, your tender meats <coughs> tend to be easier just to fry, flash fry and put into a, yeah. you know, to eat. So the backstage, just right next to the spine, yeah. that we um, just mash with a um, fork yeah. and we mix it with the liver and the heart and then we put a little bit of flour into it and maybe an onion if we got that and if we got an egg not often that would be that luxurious we put that together and make and we find it as a hamburger all right our hamburger. nice yeah so that's the easy cooking meat that's the meat that doesn't need so long, long cooking and as, as I think if some of you have only joined us uh, recently, you know, we're talking about this from an angle of a, a, a young <coughs> lady when Miriam first went out into the wilderness. She was quite young in her early 20s and um, uh, mid 20s. Yeah, 25, 6. Well, yeah, mid 20s. Yeah. So she had lived as a vegetarian for most of that time. So it was a big change for Miriam to go from. Um, uh, uh, eating only vegetables, but I think needs must. It was almost a a case of, um, you know, we think if you live in the wild that you'd be able to survive off of nuts and berries and things, but... Not in New Zealand. You could do this in Europe, perhaps in America, but... Um, in uh, reconnecting? Yeah. Just to, Is it reconnecting? To... Yeah. So, 
Did we lose you for a few seconds? Hopefully you didn't miss anything. Let's see our questions. Oh no, BH09 on topic game commentary and GF and F shorts, that second name, says so while Steve is live, um, just after midnight New Zealand time. Ah, oh, are you in New Zealand? Oh, fantastic to have New Zealand then. Whereabouts are you living in New Zealand? Um, Miriam Peters, um, a, a Kiwi from New Zealand, and Miriam is, is a New Zealander as well. Yeah. Now she's an immigrant, but she's a, a New Zealand passport, yeah. New Zealand citizen. So, and it's the country she wants to, to, to go back to, and, and, and li after they leave Australia, actually, they go back to New Zealand. And I think mainly from the South Island. Uh, I think Peter's mainly from the South. Yeah, Nelson. So if you know, if you don't know New Zealand, it's it's divided up into two large islands, and there are a lot of smaller islands on the on the coastal areas. But the it has a sort of north and south island, which have um, quite different feel to them. I think they have a you know the South Island is you know, a lot of mountainous ranges and. South Island we've got one big range, mountain range, basically. Yeah, yeah. They've got very much west coast and east coast. Yeah, and North it's Island, just volcanic, volcanic, volcanic as well. North yeah. Island's more volcanic. More volcanic, yeah. yeah. So if on the North <coughs> Island you have still a lot of mountains and hills, but it's sort of undulating hills, very beautiful. Um, both islands are very beautiful in their own way. Uh, if you're a fan of the Hobbit stories or Lord of the Rings, yeah. then that was mainly filmed in the, in the South Island, I think, was it? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. So, where are you from in New Zealand? And we have to have a short version of your name, I think. <laughs> BH09, I think. Okay. okay. Seems to be happy. If you haven't replied. We did get a disconnect just then. Okay. How many people are there I can see? 15. 15 people. So, oh. if any of you have any questions for Miriam, now bear in mind, I always think the Christchurch, fast... sorry. Christchurch, on it. I would quite cool there I mean, at the moment. Yeah, it would be. Um, if you want to, uh, a lot of you, if you've been following me on YouTube, you may not be familiar with uh, with Miriam's work, but you may, uh, we did put a few little social media links out, so if anyone knows of Miriam's work, they want to ask questions, or even if you're uh, Steve Kitchen followers for a long time, you'd like to ask some questions, uh, feel free to do so. Now, what I... I'm always fascinated by is how many of you in your lifetime have thought, you know, I'd just like to stop doing what I'm doing and just go out and live in the wilderness. I think a lot of people feel that at some times. So yeah, leave everything behind, you know, leave all that, the computer and the telephone and the email, the inbox, leave all that behind. Because job responsibilities. Yeah. You know, leave the kids behind. Love we did. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We didn't have kids, no, that one. Kiwi sense of humour, see, she's even got <laughs> about that, left the kids behind. <laughs> Miriam, that would have been a great <laughs> Miriam was a teacher in New Zealand, so she <coughs> said leave behind proper jobs and, and just gave it all Yeah, my students, I left my students behind. Yeah, yeah left her students behind. Yeah. So, um, I think it's fascinating. And when, I, when we say left behind, you didn't have any electrical appliances of any sort? No, we didn't have any machines of any kind, not even a clock. So, um, because we couldn't recharge it, it's not like the, the totally modern day Luddites. We just couldn't. Um, yes, you were. <laughs> <laughs> not, not out of principle, but you can't recharge it up there. You have no they solar panel things, but often we walk with a backpack so we don't want to carry too much. Well, we've just done two months touring around northern Australia, and I can tell you electricity is one of the biggest headaches. Uh, internet is one of the biggest headaches. And when we met um, Peter and Miriam out in the you know, the wild of, of Australia. Uh, I remember we said, oh, we'll, Michelle and I said, we'll see you tomorrow, we're leaving tomorrow, it's been a couple of days, and we said, we're leaving tomorrow, we'll see you about nine o'clock or something. And then I thought, after you left, they don't know what nine o'clock is. No. <laughs> but we've always been a bit early or something, you know? No, you were, you were a bit late, because we were... <laughs> oh, yeah, we were, I was running after you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. No, we don't know, and usually it doesn't matter. You've got to... You get a natural body clock, don't you? It's kind of you sort of have an idea that it's getting to that time of day. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, I think our, throughout history, our, our ancestors lived more by the seasons and by the rising of the sun and yeah. the setting of the sun. Of course, yeah. This wine's giving me a lot of sort of, I guess. Yeah. yeah. What sort of what? Gas. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
no. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Disaster. <laughs> like it's not the BBC, Live. huh? Live on YouTube. So we were talking the other day about occasionally when you're filming to leave some nice quiet sections, so... It'll be quiet. So there you go. That was that was done for dramatic effect. We're going to get and make some cookies. Great. You're going to make some cookies. Me? Yes. <laughs> well, you're going to do it. You're just Steve in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you if you come into my kitchen, you've got to do some cooking. Okay, great. So the first thing, whenever I'm making a lot of cookies, not all cookies, is to take your fats and your sugars and cream them together to make like a like a souffle like oh, yeah? thing. So, fat, your fats, your fats and your sugars. Yeah. So, quite often, a lot of cookies start this way. And if you add eggs into a, a batter, that's often the way you'll start as well. So, mm -hmm. if you could, we've got 100 grams of, I'm using lightly salted butter. So, wash my hands. Yes. Yeah. Now, when we were out in the bush, washing our hands was going down to the creek. With the crocodiles. With the crocodiles. Yeah. When, when we first met, Peter and Miriam, um, they were actually washing in a, a creek next to where we were camping and there were crocodiles in the, in the creek. And I said, yeah, you know there's crocodiles in that creek? And they said, oh, well, you know, they're washing away. Yeah, I didn't. There's fresh water. Yeah, they fresh don't water. Really They're quite small. So I will wash my hands as well. They're already clean. And I'm not doing the work. So if you take, we've got 100 grams of um, butter and yeah. we've got the sugar here, which is about 80 grams, I 75. think, 75, so uh, I'll get, can you tell the, the, the ounces, is that three and a half ounces? Yes. Sir. I think it's three and a half ounces of of um, butter and around about three ounces of sugar. Two and a half. Two and a half If ounces. people want it too sweet, can they reduce the you, amount of sugar? You can. A lot of my recipes, I tend to already reduce the sugar oh, from okay. my original recipes. How so much percent if you reduce it already? I usually... I keep taking sugar out of my cookies until they feel like they're okay. Yeah. You know, if you go too low, the cookies will break. Oh, break. So oh. You, you won't get a nice, you'll end up with a very bready cookie, you know. Right. You, if you don't have enough sugar in there, because as I said before, the sugar is the caramelizing sauce, you know. Yeah. So if you okay. make, for instance, biscotti, like the Italian cookies, it's that sort of, the sugar is what helps it set, like a like toffee. Okay. So if you take the sugar and add it in with the butter, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 oh. no. Now we now just get the spoon and we're just going to cream. If Miriam, you would just cream that together. So you sort of um, what you do is just kind of push uh, to the side like this until you get a nice uh, cre yeah. creamy, almost like a souffle mix. I've never this. done this sort of thing yet, but really? it's really first time, so it'll be very exciting. Okay, okay. So now, forgive my... Um... Often, let's talk about cooking then. A lot of times, a lot of people will put vanilla in with cookies. Vanilla tended to be uh, something you added to cookies to mask the flavour of eggs. We're not putting eggs into this particular cookie or... So, vanilla is not important. Someone you... says hi. Hi. Davey, how are you? <laughs> is that Steve Shirley Davey. or Dave? It's, well, I think it might be Dave. Or both of you. It's morning time. Right, this is good? That's good. So we've got this nice sort of fluffy, sweet sugar. And when you were kids, this is the stuff, mm, this is the stuff that you, you eat because you oh, eat yeah. spoon. So the next wow. thing, we've got that like that now. I'm going to take some... Why have I got two flowers here? Are the, the red flowers. flower is your, is your um, rolling help flower. Okay. I was helping out. <laughs> we are going to use self-raising flowers. So do you know what self-raising flower is? The right rises by itself. Yeah, but it you never know, help. It's a spiritual flower that rises like a ghost from the dawn. Yeah. It is basically normal flour, but it has baking powder in it or some form of baking soda in it. Um, 
Does so, that give you a lot of gas? Because one time we um, organized, we did take some self-raising flour with us to make chapatis. No, we put some baking powder in it, but I put a little bit too much, yeah. and it was a disaster. Baking powder or baking soda? Well, I can't remember. This is years ago. There's a lot of difference. So, because baking soda is pure bicarbonate, the soda, and too much of that, it can get quite um, gassy? volatile. Yeah, gassy. Yeah, we were stuck um, in a tent for a day when it rained. Yeah. So, so baking powder <laughs> a disaster. is a combination of baking soda and quite often some other. Um, uh, they have um, uh, what they put in the play doh. Oh, cream of tartar. They have a little cream of tartar in there. They have a, a coating in baking powder that stops it activating when it's connected with water. So if you like, if you put baking soda into liquid straight away, it fizzes. But baking powder has a little coating over all of the bicarbonate soda crystals, mm. so that they don't actually activate until they get to a certain temperature. And I think. It's cream of tartar and some other chemicals. So, right, right. We're going to put this in here. Yeah. So we are using self-raising flour. If you haven't got self-raising flour and you want to use all-purpose flour or brown flour, rye flour, whatever you choose, you will need to add a little bit of baking powder, probably around about a teaspoon. If you've only got baking soda, then use about half a teaspoon, and you can do that as long as you bake them straight away. So now we've got something that's looking a little bit more like a cookie dough. Yeah. Do we need to uh, switch the oven on for reheat? Good idea. No. She's, she's on the ball. She is. So. Well, she's used to doing her campfire, see, an hour before cooking. Yes, <laughs> if we cook anything in the camp oven on the campfire, we start in the morning and uh, make coals. And when the embers are really hot, we put a bread in. But this takes. At least four hours the whole the whole thing the whole morning. Yeah. We've got plenty of time. Yeah. Do you tend to keep a fire going most of the day, or do you let it go out and re restart? Mm, sometimes we let it go out, but usually we let it take over. Yeah. It depends if we've got a big log. Yeah. It takes over because for every cup of tea we need to light the fire. Yeah, it's a pain. So a when pain. we when we live in a cottage in it's France, so we try to keep the fire burning twenty four hours. So we even in, the, in the no in the winter. Yep. So you keep it going all through the, the the night and then all through the day because you. I mean, sometimes it was a very low, gentle charcoal just burning all the way. Now don't do any more mixing. Oh. If you over mix the cookies, they will get tough because you will develop the gluten. You remember we were talking about oh. that today. Yep. So we're going to use coconut flour. Is that a hundred grams, Michelle? Yes. So three and a half ounces of coconut flour. Now, why I'm doing this is because um, it added an extra layer of flavor, but you could use um, oatmeal. I wouldn't use whole oats. I would actually use oatmeal flour, so uh, it'll be a little chunky, but it still work. So I'm gonna use 100 grams of another flour. Now, another flour that might be quite nice would be almond flour or almond meal, but we're going with coconut flour. Now, for those of you that never used or never cooked with coconut flour before, have you cooked with coconut flour? No. no? Well, we it's... usually buy the old ingredients just in just simple shops, so it's all just white flour. If we're lucky, it's all. Try that. Taste it. Just a little pinch, or you can lick your finger and stick it in. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Yeah, this is really um, just coconut. Yeah. Right? It is basically. It's fantastic. Just... You just eat it like this. Oh yeah. Great scrogan, hey. Hmm? Scrogan? Scrogan. What's that? Scrogan is what you eat on the way when you are tramping. You think, oh, I'm a little bit hungry, but you can't be bothered, you know, taking out a whole meal. So you eat something, usually nuts and raisins. Like trail mix. <laughs> yeah, trail mix. Is that a Dutch word? Or? No, uh, New Zealand. Scrogan. Scrogan, yeah. Okay, scrogan. So Gil2727 says, morning all from Massachusetts, USA. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well done, Michelle, for getting Massachusetts right. Massachusetts. Sometimes struggles. So we're going to put, I'm actually going to keep a little bit back because different flowers absorb liquid slightly differently. And because coconut actually is mm. basically a dried coconut, I want to see how this mixes up. So I would cool. suggest now get your yeah. hands in, yeah? It's going to be a lot easier to pull this together with your hands. Doing it with a stick, it's just, it's not worth it. And if you could just throw a little bit over the floor as well, Mary. <laughs> 
<laughs> One thing you don't get on this um, video is the smell. Because this is really smelling very nice. Delicious, this, yeah? This coconut um, flour. Yeah, it really starts to get an appetite on yeah. your future cookies. So now you're getting an idea. When we bake this, the sugars are going to caramelize, the coconut's going to actually um, dissolve into the fat of the butter, and then they're going to make this delicious. I think that looks dry enough to me. Yeah, I ha you have to do that sometimes, right? Get up on your toes. Oh, you have to add a little bit of milk, yeah. Stephen. Remember, it was two tablespoons of milk? Oh. Yeah. I'm going to put a little splash, two, yeah, two tablespoons of milk. See, it's a little bit on the dry side. <laughs> this is sort of... Gil2727 says, sorry I'm late, what are we making today? Gil, we're making a little bit of a mess and we're also making some beautiful digestive cookies style or we're making our own, we're winging it a little bit. We're making a cookie that's made with a coconut flour so it will have almost like a coconut flavour. Yeah, but see, this looks a bit dry, doesn't it? So we're gonna some we're gonna add a milk. little. When you go back to your spoon, I think maybe. So I'm gonna add a couple of tablespoons, one and two, and that may allow us to add the rest of this flour. But we'll see. Yeah, I'd say so. So no egg is needed. No. The, the egg will make it a little bit tough. I get this you intuitive can, feeling that I need an egg for this. You but. could use egg, but you would end up, egg is another leavening agent of sorts, um, so it will actually make the cookie a little... Egg and I <laughs> <laughs> If I went, if you wanted to use egg... It's not okay. a little bit wet. Okay, so the, the flour feels, that the, the cookie dough feels good. Now, it suddenly feels like sand, like wet sand. That's the coconut doing that, yeah. Okay. I'm not going to add, I'm not going to add the full... 100 grams. So if you decide to use, uh, okay. <coughs> just breathe in some coconut. Oh, dangerous <laughs> stuff. <coughs> to fill in some health and safety forms right now. Yes, we'll probably find out in years to come that coconut flour is lethal. <laughs> and and <laughs> found that we're just it. Miriam and myself in hospital somewhere grumbling about how one day we got so. poisoned by yeah. So take it, do we take it out of the bowl right now? Yeah, and normally I'd chill that. We should, if we were good Blue Peter presenters, which is a children's program from when I was young, we would yeah. have one ready-made in the fridge that's nice and chilled. But we haven't. That. So we're going to go straight with this. And are, we gonna, are we going to... Smells this really nice. I could eat it we just like that. We could add a little bit of bowl Okay. This is why Miriam <laughs> is woman in the wilderness. This is why this young lady goes out hunting in the wilderness because she's right. See the way she's beating my cookies? <laughs> do you not do it that way? Oh, I don't hit it quite so hard. I'm, I'm quite oh. gentle with it. Oh, I'm used to baking bread, but bread is really, really No, because we don't want to develop gluten. No gluten. No gluten. We don't want chewy cookies. Do we want chew well, we don't want... It could be nice. No, we don't want... No, they'd be tough cookies. Your audience, do you like chewy cookies or do you like not chewy cookies? So we'll take a little bit of a poll here. If you <laughs> no guys one. are watching... They don't want it. says, cookies have feelings too. Yeah, <laughs> they. But these cookies why, yeah, have why no feelings. They don't have feelings these time. cookies now have no feelings at all. They are basically inanimate. They've been beaten to death. <laughs> <laughs> by the wilderness lady. Yeah, so, it can't be helped. Can't be helped. So, um, quick vote out there. Everybody tell us chewy cookies or crisp cookies. What's your preference? Because uh, I need to beat up a bit more when it's chewy, right? That's your... No, if you that. want a chewy cookie, actually, it's a different story. We'll do that in a minute, but it's, it's oh, actually... Okay, it's so we don't have any choice after all. <laughs> yes. It's to do with baking time and sugar content and things like A little more complicated than that. Yeah. Okay, well, Michelle, what do they say? Uh, nothing at the moment. They're not answering you. They've gone to sleep. Oh, no, right, no, answer. Them. Turn your back. <laughs> chewy cookies or crisp cookies? Come on, answer. Yeah, there they come. Where's the rolling pin? Were we going to do rolling pin or not? Well, you weren't, but it's just out that door if you do want it. Okay, I shall be back. Of course, in the bush we don't have a rolling pin, but we just use a, um, a honey jar, and it works just as well. So you don't need to invest in rolling pins at all. <laughs> so we are going to roll the cookies. One. 
Well, wine bottles are working well. Wine bottles work really well, but yeah. they haven't cleaned this one. Kept, and we're still drinking it. Yeah, that's right. Not very soon enough. Not. Right. Can I do this or? You should do it. I'm oh, you're filling up the wine. It's getting me more drunk. I'm going to put. But for most people, this is the morning, so they won't be drinking at all. Just making the drinks. So they'll put some flour on the top as well? You might need to. Let's see first, it might oh. roll nicely. Just jet. Oh, oh, not so hard. Oh, this is really good. soft. Though. Yes. <laughs> Okay, you can't, with a, because this cookie is going to be quite a, almost a shortbread cookie. I don't think people can see this this dough, can they? Yes, they can yeah. see it. And yeah, uh, Gil2727 says, Chewy and Chris, you can't make a decision, they're both great. Love the cookies. Digestive equals crispy for me. Oh. <laughs> okay. okay, that's great answer. So it's a very gentle roll, and also okay. then keep pulling it in to, to, as it cracks. Just, pull it in. just cracks. Yeah, this but that's is normal. normal. That's normal. Egg. Oh, I thought it no, egg. because then it's a hard cookie. We don't want a hard cookie. <laughs> okay. Don't trust me. Okay, I'll trust you. We're in the kitchen. In Steve's kitchen. Okay. We're going to cut these with. Wow, I'm going to cut it, It's cracking. But I guess, you know, what well, doesn't matter which size the cookies are. I'll tell you what we're, <laughs> I'll tell you what we're going to do then. Because, this is, because what's happened is because rather than using two types of flours which will give us additional gluten and we're using something that's very short yeah. uh, coconut flour is short it has no gluten in it at all what we're going to do is we're going to make like a shortbread a, a scottish shortbread so we're going to make a round cookie and it'll look like it won't work how does it got people at home how do you get on with um with making these cookies I mean, does it crack too? Or? Well, if they if they're making a shortbread cookie, like a Scottish shortbread, it always cracks. But we're hoping, okay, we're hoping, and I think actually by doing this, we need to change the, the methodology a little bit. Can't we slide this onto the paper? Oh, that's a good idea. So we're sliding this on. Are you actually just pushing it on there? Okay. So we just yep. you saw what we did there. We've we've had a little change of heart. I'm not. We haven't got a cookie cutter. So what I'm going to do is roll this out and keep pulling it together. Dwayne will lady car says hello Steve. Hey Dwayne, how are you? Dwayne's a regular, he's often Oh really? Often in, yeah, he comes in. Well, Dwayne's been Gil 2727 says I've made shortbread with corn, flour and regular flour. They're very dry when putting together. Yes, yeah. with the corn flour and regular flour. They are, great. because the corn flour has no gluten in it at all, so it has no structure to hold it together, so it's a, a, what we call a short... Um, so if you want to use those two flours, what would you use to, um, to solve the problem? Uh, it's not a problem, it's a good thing. It's oh. a lovely crumbly smelt in the mouth cookie. Yeah, so just it crumbles, you just sort of eat it with a spoon? No, it's no. going <laughs> to... Uh, Do you have a shortbread? Do you know what a shortbread is? you know what a shortbread cookie is? Shortbread, just short, shortbread. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> not only, it's not, <laughs> not only the bread is like this long, it's a bit shorter. <laughs> it's, got, it's, got, <laughs> it's got a cost or something? Okay. This, really, is, for, uh, this is for Dutch, Dutch for bread. Dutch. Okay. Short. Okay, remember I told you about how gluten, the two strands, they stick together and they yeah. make a strand of gluten. You have two proteins in flour called glut glutenin and gliadine. They're two natural proteins in flour, mm -hmm. and they make two strands which make, uh, uh, which change it to gluten, a gluten strand. I hope I'm getting this right, I'm pretty sure I am. <laughs> and those strands are long strands which are very elastic. Remember we talked about this yeah. before? Yeah. Were you paying attention in school this morning? Yeah, yeah, I saw it on, the, uh, on your YouTube. Oh, Fantastic. YouTube. I do remember that condom sort of affected me. And... <laughs> okay, we just made this... Uh, adult rating show. So yeah, I have a video showing you how to extract gluten out of flour. It's a good video if you want to check it out. Fantastic. Michelle will put we'll a, yeah. a link there. So just, only really... Uh, just say goodbye to Tim Fletcher, he's got to go. Oh. Say goodbye to Tim. Bye bye Tim. Thank you Tim for joining us. Um, so when you use flours that have that are very low or have no gluten in at all which is included in wheat uh, um, uh, corn flour and uh, uh, rice flour and coconut flour there's no chance for those long strands of gluten so we mm. call those short flours 
Oh, so when you know that's when, the word shortening. And you know when you add butter to flour, they call it shortening. Shortening. Oh, yeah. Do you yeah. have that yeah. term? Yeah. Okay, so what that actually does, it shortens the, the gluten strands. That's why it's called shortening. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So now mm, we're going to lift that over yeah. onto our baking sheet. Probably should make it a little bit thinner. We can just push this out. So just, just shape that up a little bit for me. And do with your, this or with your hands? Yeah. yeah. See how strong she is? She's been out in the wilderness, so she's going to completely <laughs> wreck it. Wreck my beautiful shortbread cookie. See, it's cracking. This will happen at home as well. But don't worry about it because it even happens in you, Steve's kitchen. You have to pull it. <laughs> if you look at my recipe on Steve's kitchen for sh perfect Scottish shortbread, you will see that this is how you do it. And often the Scots used to use rice flour or corn flour, more often rice flour in their biscuit to make it really crumbly. Oh, but it okay. also makes it yep. quite buttery and it makes it... Um, so is it a good biscuit to sort of dip in the tea? No. No! This is, <laughs> this is not going to be a biscuit. In your tea and sits on the bottom of your cup. Okay, but what we're going to do <laughs> is we're going to score it <coughs> with a knife. Yeah, I've got a, a bread knife here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to score this before we bake it. Okay, so while they're doing that, Duane says shortbread pastry has less gluten, or in some cases none, gluten in regular flour stretches when a leavening agent is used. Wow, very informed. Did you, just, <coughs> did you know that by hand, or yeah. did you get that off the internet? Well, gluten, Duane, is a, as it, you're right, but gluten is in all, all um, wheat flour, um, because the two proteins, and depending on whether it's a winter wheat flour or a, or a spring wheat flour or a summer wheat flour, depends on the level of protein that is in the, the, the grain. So we, we tend to find winter, I think winter wheats uh, are, I won't quote that because I could be wrong, it's either winter wheats or, or spring wheats that have more protein. I'm pretty sure it's winter wheats that make the strong bread flours. So uh, mm. Gil2727 says, I never knew that, Steve, interesting about short flowers. I never realised the term short had to do with the flowers. Me neither. Um, and shortening is, is not actually to do with the flower, but it's the fact that you're adding a fat to the flower to, to shorten the gluten strand. So if you have um, some very enriched doughs like uh, brioche, you know, the French make the brioche, yep. has a lot of fat in it, a lot of butters and natural oils, mm -hmm. so that shortens the, uh, the natural gluten in the flour, so it needs a lot more work. They don't actually want to shorten it, they want to still keep the gluten, so the way they, they do that is that long fermentation period, so if you have like a brioche, you can't just make it in one hour, you have to take quite a few hours, maybe even overnight, because there's a lot of butter in it, butter is a shortening agent, <coughs> it takes a long time for those two proteins to find each other. They're sort of almost oh. looking for each other in the flour when it's wet and they, they sort of tangle around each other and make a little stretchy elastic band like this. Oh, fantastic. So Dwayne says gluten is a type of protein and Gil2727 says baking really is chemistry. It is chemistry. Right. Yeah. Even wild baking is a chemistry of sort, isn't it, when you think of yeah, you're making, you're putting ingredients, yeah, put something together, you get something totally different. We're going to bake this for about, we'll go for 12 minutes and have a look, but I think probably about 15 minutes. Uh, I don't know this oven very well, so we'll have to keep an eye on it. Yeah, so who else is doing this? I want to know how many people are putting this right in the oven at the same time. Anyone actually That's cooking ma this? That's magical. Don't burn your hands. The top Yeah, that would be fine. Michelle, would you please kindly give us a... 12 minute timer. So, you need to wash your hands a little bit and yep. just freshen up. Yep. So, uh, Dwayne says um, butter is kind of barrier, keeping the gluten more compact. It is. It, 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 it retards the ability for both the two, the two proteins to bind together, Dwayne. So, um, it's why we tend to call it a shortening, and it's also why an enriched dough, such as a brioche or any dough that has a lot of uh, butters or lards or fats in it. And he also says baking is an exact science, whereas cooking is not. 
Yes. Why is that? Because you have to um, get all the temperature ready on that and make the um, put it in a certain amount of time in the oven. Or yeah, he's right. Is that Dwayne Sanders? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he's right. I mean, there. You know, when we bake in the bush, <laughs> we tend to not use scales and weights. And I always am a bit of an advocate of saying to people, "You do not there." Yeah, because we don't have them. No. And if you but if you bake on a regular basis, you get a feel, don't you? You understand the feel for the bread and how it's about right. If it's yeah. too wet or it's too dry. But if you want to share a recipe with somebody over a distance, you can't say to them, "Take a cup of flour and a cup of water and mix it together," because somebody might have a cup like this, and they might compact the flour in and put it in their bowl, and then they get a cup of water and add it. Compacted flour like this is weighs a lot more than if you just somebody else gets spoons. Spoon. Yeah. So it's if you're sharing a recipe with someone, it's best to give them the weight of the recipe so that they can recreate the exact recipe. Oh, more. rather than volume-wise. Yeah. yeah. But once you're accomplished with cooking, you can actually get a feel. If you're always making bread, you you know how it feels, so you can kind of work without weights and measures. Yeah, I usually never make any measurement of any kind, except when we make kebab bread, we use five cups of white flour and five cups of wholemeal flour. Right. That is a lot, right? And we eat this bread, which is like this big, in five days. Five cups? No, that is a lot of bread eating. That is a lot of bread eating. How big is it? Huge, this big, this high. Cups, when you say cups, are you using a standard measurement cup or no, just one of your cups? <laughs> one of your cups, yeah? Yeah, just one of our cups. So that's the thing that I'm saying, you know. So, but we're not trying to uh, recreate this recipe. But the water, I just add water until it feels good. Yes. And we don't know how long we're going to bake, it's totally dependent on the wood. If the wood is very hot, then we of course need totally different kind of baking. Yeah, because we're not hard to adjust to the um, circumstances. And do you sometimes take the uh, the are you baking in the in the camp oven? Yeah, that was what we are talking about here. Yeah, the, like yeah. a like a not a, not a new oven. <laughs> what we call a Dutch oven. Yeah, work, but not know? in Holland. No, nobody would have a Dutch oven in Holland. No, right? we, we often, often, no. no. So coming from Holland, maybe that's a little bit sort of strange to hear it called a yeah. Dutch oven. Yeah. But yeah, that's what it is, Dutch oven, Kenbaum. I don't know if the history, anyone know the history of why we call it a Dutch oven? Maybe you can have a look for us. There must be a link with some yeah. Dutch somewhere. Oh, mm -hmm. I suspect it's something to do with the early Dutch settlers in America when they were coming over to hop to the US and they yeah, bought they... these cast iron, uh, big cast iron ovens, uh, pots yeah. with them, and maybe uh, the Americans gave that terminology of a Dutch yeah. oven. Mm -hmm. My Huh? Um, BHO9 was talking about when you were putting the cookie in the oven, as long as you don't burn it, it's edible. I had a burnt Subway biscuit before, it was not great. Oh no. And uh, Gil2727 says, I'm not baking cookies right now, it's 8am here. That would be wonderful for <laughs> later on. Cookies for morning breakfast. morning tea time. Oh. But breakfast. In, in the US, many don't use scales because of all these YouTube vids from overseas. I bought scales and bake so much better. Why don't they use scales in the US? There's a there's a tradition in uh, or actually a, a tradition in cooking in the U.S. to only talk about cups measurements, but actually it's, oh, only volume ones. Yeah, saying that. but it's it's become a problem because it's when you talk. Say my grandma used to make a, a recipe for bread, and she used four cups of flour to two cups of water or whatever, uh, depending on the percentage. Um, it works, and your grandma would always cook a perfect loaf of bread. But if you took that same recipe and you put it into a different size cup or or you compacted the cup. See if you loose cup and, and compacted cup can be a thirty percent difference in, in, in weight. Yeah. So you'd say, Oh I can't make this bread like my grandma used to make it. She gave me the recipe, she wrote it down. Yeah. Um, it's not a good way to transfer recipes. So if yeah. you have cookbooks it's often better to not use cup measurements, particularly yeah. when you're using baking for you know it's always very hard if somebody says to you my cake keeps dropping or the collapsing. I, I'm trying to do a sponge cake and it collapses. And you say, well, how did you make it? Oh, I use three cups of flour to three cups of milk to three cups of sugar. You know, and you say, well, that's not a good way to bake because a, a cake particularly it has to be quite accurate. I mean, once you've got, and I, there's nothing wrong with cups. If you're used to using the cups and you're very 
uh, you're using the same recipes over and over again. So a lot of more people now in the US are starting to um, use weights and measurements. And scales like this, a little set of digital scales like this, they can be as little as five to ten dollars. So it makes mm -hmm. a lot of difference. Yeah. And uh, I've noticed now, if you look at the American Test Kitchen on YouTube, which is a, a very professional sort of um, school for teaching, they really advocate and they push people to try to buy scales and cook with. And even, um, I think, some of the more older traditional cooking shows like Martha Stewart and that hopefully by now is starting to talk about using weights and measurements. I don't want to force that upon people because when I cook out in the bush, I don't use weights and measurements, but no. but I'm familiar with my recipes. Yeah, that's right. You go by feeling. When you're kneading the, the dough, you, yeah. you know that you need more water. Yeah. yeah. So um, more questions are coming in. So what I'd like to, to suggest, how many people have we got in at the moment? Um, Twelve. If anyone's got any questions that they'd like to ask about Miriam, if you've not actually checked out, hey look, this is not an advertising break. Miriam, do, <laughs> do the hard sell. <laughs> we, my, partner, my partner Peter and I, we've lived for eight years in the wilderness in New Zealand. We wrote a book about it, called Woman in the Wilderness. And um, it's translated into four different languages, next week Chinese. Any Chinese watchers right at the moment? Yeah, we have a lot of viewers from, from different parts of Southeast Asia and China. Well, that's fantastic. You're reading Chinese comes out in November, so any time um, next week, perhaps. I didn't know you could write in Chinese. It's been translated by somebody. Oh! I wrote it in English, and somebody else translated it into Dutch, but I could read the translation. So it's good that way. I think that's amazing. German. So it's in German, Dutch, English. French, next French. April. Uh, Chinese, Mandarin, I'm guessing, Putonghua. Yeah. Yeah. Then uh, Kiwi and Australian, and it's been translated into British. So, this or brown? That's English still. <laughs> you, can't just say, you can't just say um, like lots of English languages and make them sound It's a different, different book. It's a different, different book. Totally different. Oh, okay. Different, um, they checked it all. Okay, so many languages. That's right. So there's no excuses. And not Spanish yet? Not yet Spanish. Uh, Turkish almost. Almost got to a, they're still looking at it right now. Right. So we travelled into Turkey and then television came and made this program and the publishers got interested and we're nearly there. With a very famous uh, Ben Fogel? Yeah, Ben Fogel, uh, very famous in the UK, came to visit us last June and will be on television, New Lives in the Wild, in January. So look out for that in January. New Lives in the Wild, that yep. will be featuring um, Peter and Miriam, because after they lived for seven years, if it wasn't enough that they lived for seven years, eating just wild game and berries and dry pulses in the wilderness in New Zealand, they then left New Zealand and went to um, Europe. Yep. They walked 2,000 kilometers in Western Europe and Bulgaria and Turkey. So um, during that time we got quite a bit of media, so you will see that on television. So that's a thousand kilometres from the west of France all the way across to, uh, where was the finishing point? In, um, in south of Germany, so that was one thousand kilometres all through the mountains. Okay, and then they did another, the, the second walk, so another two, another thousand kilometres. Another thousand kilometres in Bulgaria and Turkey. Turkey is a marvellous country, if you like food should go to Turkey because the food is just absolutely amazing and the people as well. Yeah. Because well, they get you in, into their kitchens and into their houses and then you eat the food. I have never been to Turkey and Michelle and I have often Oh, talked. that is just fantastic. We, we desperately want to go to Turkey and, and check out the food yeah. and Bul Bulgaria also. It's an area I haven't been, so... No. A question? Gil has worked out where the term Dutch oven comes from. Ah, thank you, ah. Gil. Okay, and it's cut from Wikipedia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In the well, US, 1707, Abraham Darby patented the process of casting iron in sand, which derived from the Dutch Netherlands manufacturing Dutch oven has endured for over 300 years since at least 1710. So it's the method of casting the iron, iron in, in sand. sand that came from the great Dutch yeah. wow. pioneers. Great invention. Yeah. yeah, so we're still using it so regularly. So it's interesting, you know, if, if any of you are not familiar with Dutch history, and I know um, now Miriam uh, counts herself as a proud uh, New Zealander, but 
you know, the Dutch are a fantastic nation of travelers and engineers and um, famous for the little boy with a finger in the dike. That's yeah, well, he saved the dog. He did. Because maybe not everybody knows but the Dutch um, gain land by putting dikes in front of the sea. So they have all that land behind the dike. That's extra. And that land is, of course, very salty. So then they have to desalt on it. They had to desalinize the land yes. to make it grow, to yep. make it useful, because all the land was full of heavy saline, things. saline, yeah. So yeah, but this little boy and he saved him. Yeah. Is that story quite prevalent in Holland? They talk about that story, the boy in the dark? Yeah. Okay, because we, I grew up with oh, that story right. myself. He saved us. Saved. <laughs> and this is, is that a true story? Uh, of course. <laughs> so it's nearly, nearly just 12 minutes. <clears throat> okay. And um, so, sorry, I just have to say, um, Gil says cheaper way of making pots back then, the preferred method was brass. Brass, yes. Oh, they, would beat, they would beat the brass, uh, you know, take l uh, lumps of brass. Oh, brass is, a, is an alloy, I believe it's a copper alloy. Yep. So they would, you know, use it for beating out pans. But the beauty of a Dutch oven, or the cast iron oven, has some great advantages over a brass oven in that it holds the heat for much longer and it dissipates the heat really well. Oh, that's fine. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. So you can actually, now it has some disadvantages, it holds the heat very well. That can sometimes, when you're frying things, it can be a problem because you yeah. can't take the heat down really quickly. No, it's not for frying, yeah, it's ready for baking. Yeah, yeah. Burn long term thing. Super yeah. quick. Yeah. So, um, but it has some great advantages for being a great dissipator of heat. So it's great for doing stews and and yeah. uh, curries would be good in a stock pot, I guess, in a, yeah. in a Dutch oven. Normally, we cook in a billy, which is just a, a pot with um, a billy can, a handle. That's a, a, in Australia we call them billy cans. I don't know if they call them that in other parts of the world. Do you well, call we just call them a billy. Yeah. By the name billy. Don't know. Why they call it billy, but anyway, you know, the, the curries we, we cook in the billy, and yeah. the bread we cook in the camp oven. Yeah. yeah. Well, Dwayne says maybe the Dutch oven got its name from the early settlers in Pennsylvania, the German settlers or the Dutch settlers. I, I think Pennsylvania and Dutch would also have some of that would have probably been where those traditions of casting was there some mention of that in the Wikipedia that um, it was in the from, US? Not from the no. Wikipedia, but then Dwayne says, My parents' friends are from Holland, he told me that the Dutch were extensive travellers in the olden days, they went to many parts of the world. They did, and actually uh, one of our viewers, if you're still there, Solon, Dave, is from Holland uh, in Michigan, and um, where he lives in Michigan, that has a huge Dutch uh, um, uh, history, you know, the people in that area, I think yeah. it's called Holland, um, they have a Dutch, um, so, and it's a beautiful, have you ever been to Holland, Michigan? No. You'd love it. Yeah, and can I speak Dutch there? You can they actually. Speak, you, they still speak Dutch? They do speak Dutch, yeah. Would it be very different Dutch, like very old fashioned? We'd have to ask them, but I suspect it might be a real old style, almost like the Amish yeah. speak German. They would speak Dutch yeah. in the old style. So, uh, I don't know for sure. I don't know if Dave would know that. Shirley might know. I don't know if those, because if, Dave's actually not from that area. He's from the south, from way down south. Oh, yeah, they're commenting straight away. Yeah. Yeah. Indonesia has people with Dutch an ancestry, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. 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 Some people in Indonesia. Some people. But they don't like the Dutch. They, they, they shout at you and say, Blondo, bon, Blondo. Okay, and <laughs> also, you? in we lived in Sri Lanka for some years. And they have a, a Dutch history there, and a lot of the um, the burgers in Sri Lanka have Dutch history. So you see a lot of Sri Lankan um, people with very fair skin, quite often with blue yeah. eyes and, and fair hair. Yeah. But they are traditional Sri Lankans, but they're the burger people. Oh, from, maybe. From many years. Yeah, the Dutch they like to travel because Holland <laughs> is very crowded, very small country, and it rains a lot. So there's no wonder that people years. like to escape. So we're going to take this wow, single, this is going to be fantastic. single cookie out of here. 15 minutes here. Now my, um, let me just bring that close to the camera. Whoop. It's looking really, it's looking more brown than what looks on the camera. Yeah. So we're going to let this brown. cool down. And then. What can we eat it now? It's too hot. The sugars are still too soft. So okay. we have to let it cool. 
Sure. Really last so I want that you burn your mouth? No, oh. at 180 degrees Celsius, which is something else in Fahrenheit altogether, we need to check the 350 degrees yeah. Fahrenheit. Yeah. Um, the sugars that are in there now are like molten sugar, you know, so if you put that in your mouth, it will burn. But also the sugars are still fluid. They have to get below 100 degrees. I think I can try some. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is smelling delicious, ladies and gentlemen. This is absolutely fantastic. Shall we I let just her, can't wait shall we let her try to have, some? have one. Just wave like it in the air. It's like having a child. <laughs> Like having a child in the kitchen with you, it's okay. so nice to have someone that's so excited. Well, I'm not really yeah. patient, I'd wait. BH09 says, question for both, what are your all-time favourite type of cookies to eat? I never eat any cookies, so this will be my, fa my first time. She's a liar. She's lying. Oh, sorry, when I was a kid, I <laughs> eat speculars. She never ate speculars cookies, cookies Except for yesterday and this morning. Yeah, speculars will be my favourite. It's especially very, very good. So I forgot about it totally until Steve got it for me yesterday. So I cut a little bit of cookie. Um, I'm laughing because because we knew you were coming, we bought some speculars cookies, which are a very traditional Dutch cookie, and they're a sort of... Um, um, I'll show you the packet. Not matter. So that's got a little windmill on it. So it's and called very, uh, um, speculas. Traditional. So how do you say? Speculas. 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 Ah, speculas. Dutch spiced cookies. So we do actually have some cookies, but um, Miriam did have cookies yesterday. She did have cookies today. Yeah. So goes all the time. I I, okay. I like ginger biscuits. They're very kiwi. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, can I oh. yeah. So you see how it's quite a lot more solid than, than it. Mm. So it's good, right? I don't know. I mean, Very is, nice. it, is it good? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to try some Very as well. Nice. So don't forget, we made this with the coconut flour. Mm -hmm. So can you taste the coconut flavour in there? Mm -hmm. it coming through, or it's quite light? Quite light. Mm -hmm. So would you say this is a healthy snack? Yes. Because you have coconut. There must be some good value. Yeah. If this is almost a vegetarian meal, it's almost a diet food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a diet food. Would you lose I'm weight? I'm losing weight looking at it. Yeah, looking at it. This You're certainly right. Looking at it, you lose weight. Yeah, what about eating it? it? Eating it, you might put a little bit of weight on. Yeah. But you need a little bit of weight, I don't. I need a cup of coffee or tea. Do you want tea? Yeah, tea would be nice. No, too late for us to have coffee. Yeah. Wow, that's got a little subtle coconut, like not yeah. really strong. It's very light, isn't it? Yeah. Because we've only used 50% um, coconut flour with regular flour, but you can taste it. Yeah. And could you could you put cinnamon or something in it, or mm. would it be totally different? Would it have a different name? Do you know what I would put in with that? Mm. Cardamom. Cardamom. Mm. Mm. Because and nutmeg. I think cinnamon could be a little overbearing, but oh, um, it's a little bit. But cardamom is just that little bit more yeah. subtle, and the flavour is a little more floral. Well, I guess everyone can just experiment with yeah. um, putting all sorts of stuff in. Of course, it's easy enough to make. Even if it's it's a total disaster, you can just throw it away. <laughs> I mean, it's easy enough, isn't it? And it wouldn't be, you know, the end of the world. If your wine's gone. Yeah, you could, you would, should never throw it away. What you, should you do with it if it's a disaster? Give it to your neighbours. Your neighbours? Offer it to your neighbours. Hello, they're young. <laughs> they're a lovely pie. And you would, would never throw a cookie away. And to be honest, that's too nice to throw away. Well, this is very nice. I'm, I'm meaning to say if it's, if it's a disaster, if you put in too much cinnamon or... Yeah. So, um, so Dwayne says, I think that China also has an area with people who have Dutch ancestry, so does the Caribbean. Yeah. Isn't this very annoying for people wanting? <laughs> is, that, is that a bit noisy? We just took a, it's a bit <laughs> Oh, got to take. <laughs> and, and Gil Sorry, says, guys, we're off, we're off blind now for five minutes. Whoa! <laughs> Gil says, hearing static on the audio. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually the kettle boiling. Excuse me. Yeah. Please excuse just a few moments, we're going to...
Oh, oh, it's the water. Yeah, it's not a cup of tea with our biscuits. We want something a little... It's actually um, a cookie like this. I think it needs just a little bit of um, hot beverage, maybe some nice chocolate, a hot chocolate. Yeah, or a don't dip tea. it. If you were doing it in the morning for breakfast, have it with a nice coffee. So, yeah. you said that's fine, you must have tea and cookies. No, and, um, I, need to, I need to bake these, yes, with cardamom and nutmeg. Cardamom and nutmeg. and nutmeg would be nice. Um, you yeah, could even make a chocolate version, I suppose, if you put some cocoa in there, it could be slightly more chocolatey flavour. You can do whatever, I would say. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Miriam has said you can do whatever. Whatever you like. I would actually probably do what you said and put cinnamon in there because you like cinnamon, right? So you like you. I heard like it's the... very healthy cinnamon. It's good for diabetes, is that? Well, cinnamon has a slightly more peppery flavour than than um, than cardamom. That's why I was thinking cardamom because it's oh, yeah. a little less peppery. Yeah. So, um, BH09 says going off, going to head off to sleep now. Awesome stream so far. Stay up. It was worth watching. Oh, beautiful. Oh, thank you for saying that. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good night. Good night. Sleep. What would you say in Dutch? Have a good night? Well, uh, slap lekker. How do you say? Slap lekker. Slap lekker. Like slap good, we would say in yeah. German, you say slap good. Yeah, so you say, night. Yeah. good night is good night. Yeah. Slap good night. Can you help teach me? Slap, slap lekker. lekker. Slap lekker. Slap lekker. Don't do that other thing, that little roll. How do you do lekker. that? Lekker. Lekker. <laughs> Can you not do her? No, you do. Yeah. That's the yeah. French because they lived in France, so oh, they yeah. they do this uh, and they're very very oh, yeah. rude, but uh, it's not very uh, Dutch. It's not very Dutch. No, you have to say the. Slam lekker, lekker. Slam lekker. Yeah. Okay. Everybody, give that a try. Say it yeah. a little bit louder. Practice on at home. You say it one more time, nice and loud. Slam lekker. But it's a very short roll. Lekker. 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 Yeah. Lekker. Right, we're having a cup of tea now. It's a beautiful. Um, that language is great. I mean, I don't know if any of you speak languages. Clear, clearly, Miriam speaks three languages, I think, that I, I've heard you speak. You speak fairly good French. French and German, and I've learned to speak some of Bulgarian. Oh, okay. No. So. Say good night in Bulgarian. <laughs> <laughs> Dobra nost. Dobra nost. Dobra nost. Yeah. So um, we're sat here. We're not having like we're, we're having just regular tea bags. But this is uh, for those of you that care to know, and I know some people do. This is an English breakfast tea by Twinings. No sponsor. <laughs> Dwayne said that is why Hollandaise sauce is called that name. The Dutch have a great dairy. Mm. Oh yeah. The Frisian cows, they give a lot of milk and they make fantastic butter and cheese. That's because they're Frisian. Frisian. That's yeah, right. That's why they wear woolly jumpers. Yeah, I'm not Frisian, but... Yeah. Had I been Frisian, you would have known straight away, because I would have been this tall and I wouldn't even fit in that camera. Explain yourself. Frisians, Explain yourself. Frisians are very, very tall people. Are they? Yeah, and they're all called something like, um, stra. Like, like stra and... So <laughs> Frisian is a, a Dutch province. province. Right in the north. Yeah. Where the tallest people, uh, almost the tallest people in the world come from. Wow. Yeah, for some reason, that, I think it's the milk. Must be. Because have you seen a Frisian cow? It's huge. It's huge, yeah. Black and white, yeah. Black and white, they're very big. Yeah. They give like how many litres of milk a day? One, one of the best uh, milk producers. I think there's a better milk producer, but I think now or some crossbreed of a Frisian. But they're basically a dairy. When you see the pictures of a black and white cow, it's a Frisian cow. Mm -hmm. Frisian. Frisian. Yep. That's right. So, so we're giving um, lessons on speaking proper Frisian now. Yep. Twain says Twining's is great tea. Twining's is good tea. <laughs> yeah. So, once your cookie, now see it's still too hot. But How do you judge when it's too hot or not? The different touch or? Uh, yeah, as soon as I pick that, it's breaking. It's breaking. Oh, so when it's breaking, it's too hot. Yeah, you can see. Put it down here. There we go. Great. Wow, this is a good, real good cookie. Cooked enough? Mm, very nice. A little bit 
from, from Michelle. I was going to say, I wouldn't doing, know. She's been doing a good job <laughs> over there. A bit for me. So, passing on all the questions, but there's not many questions at the moment there, no. Steve. What do you reckon? No. This is um, poetic silence at the moment. We've mm -hmm. added this in for... So meditation purposes. It's to calm the mind down. For Medicaid. Oh. Ah. Question. Oh. Come on, Michelle. She's got a mouthful of cookie now. She yeah. can't speak. She's probably got a choke. Lots of lots of questions. Lots of questions now. <laughs> so she ends up <laughs> struggling. So Dill says, my nephew needs to visit Denmark. He's six foot eight. Make make him seem normal height. Hmm. Totally normal. He won't be totally normal. What if he went to everyone the, is this song. If he went to the Frisian part of Holland in the north. Yeah, would it be better? But Denmark is, you know. Mm. Well, Denmark, so, we're actually talking about Holland, not Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> so he says I'm still here. Davy, is it Dave or Shirley? Oh, I haven't said. And Dwayne says I think my friend's parents came from Friesland. Hope they got that right, that name right. My friend's cousin thinks the tall height came from Scandinavian roots somewhere. Oh, totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the heart comes from Friesland, Friesland, because of the milk. So, you so what's your surname? You're because wrong that will be totally Friesian. Well. Oh, so Gil meant Holland. Oops, sorry, I got those countries mixed up. <laughs> no. Ah. <laughs> yeah, not very Denmark. easy to. Very easy. It's very easy to mix up because they're all so close together and they're all small and Dutch, Danish, you know. Yeah. So Deutsch. Martha Markik. Says hello. Oh, hello. And, and Martha. Martha. Oh, Martha. Yeah. And it must be Dave because he says Shirley's mum still speaks Dutch. Oh, <laughs> yes. Wow. Yes. Like real Dutch. That's why I say on Shirley's side, they have Dutch ancestry. Mm. Dave doesn't. Dave is from alligator country. He's from way down south. Wow. So. Alligator country. Oh. Uh, alligator. Alligator. Yeah. So who else is eating these biscuits? Anybody? Mm. Are you actually cooking something or? Yeah, ma'am. Now, interesting, another little side story about how, because some of you might like to know how did um, Mir Miriam and Peter survive financially during uh, a lot of their adventures. And actually, um, Miriam is a really great guitar and singer so she she busks and you actually did uh, some musical training when you were younger and i think you um mm -hmm. taught music at one time as well didn't you didn't you do some teaching yeah so sort of, you know it's a hobby sort of thing yeah so t tell people how you would you know, leave the wilderness sometimes to to get some extra cash to to buy groceries while you were in the wild mm, yeah sometimes we go to um to see friends in the, in the city or a town and there I would find my guitar because that's what I need for um, for playing. Then I would take my guitar and go to the supermarket. And in the supermarket they have this uh, place where they put the trolleys, which is very good for acoustics. So for singing it's all about acoustics. And um, then I would sing all my songs. And I would sing songs that the people recognize. Because I found out that's what people like. And uh, in New Zealand there are a lot of people over 65. So I sing songs like John Denver and Joan Byers. And you know, all the sort of 60, 70 songs. But you like Joan Bias as well. You're yes, I like Joan Bias. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so those are the songs I sing. And I make quite a lot of money with that. And uh, that's how we survive financially. But at the moment, I also make some money with the royalties of the book. Yeah. But the fa I think the fascinating thing for people to know is that you yeah. used to hitchhike quite often some hours back to the towns oh, and then yeah. you would uh, sing outside the supermarket get because made. I never knew if I would make any money I thought I'd hitchhike because uh, sometimes I didn't have any choice at all but um, so uh, and you always meet nice people when you're hitchhiking so I've hitchhiked probably thousands of times over the last year yeah uh, possibly we shouldn't advocate young ladies it's a very very dangerous and don't try this at home yeah it's one of those things that um, when we were younger, everybody used to hitchhike, but and, and um, Miriam does it almost matter of fact. You know, I hitchhike into the city and I, I, I bust and sing songs and make some money. And you did make quite good money. We, for tax and re tax purposes, we won't say how much. We don't um, reveal just how much it is, but it is a lot, enough to live on. 
also because we are living on very little money, obviously. Yep. But I only hate China because I believe, and this might not be true, but um, this is what I believe, that I'm stronger than the driver. So if anything happens, then I think I can fight them off. And I can uh, testify to that because I remember when we first... <laughs> you went <went> wrong? <laughs> I went wrong? No. no when, I, when, I, when I first met... Oh, when the second time I, I met Peter and Miriam, Michelle and I, I think we, we, we meet them together, um, Miriam was carrying a five-gallon drum of water on your shoulder. No, not a... Yeah, it was like two times 15 kilos. 15 yeah, kilos. 15... Plus. Two of them. She had a... She was... She got some water from yeah. the uh, from one of the guys who was camping nearby. Yeah, I ran out of water. And, and he too. kindly yeah. gave them... Filled up their water. Yeah. And I've seen this lady walking across the, the outback you know, the bush, we were on actually a, a cattle station, and she's carrying this huge, great big drum of water, and this thing was full. I mean, it was, I don't know how many uh, gallons it was, but it was, it was... I think it was 25 litres, actually. Yeah, 25 yeah, litres, so, like that. so that's 25 kilos, and she's walking across, carrying it on her shoulder like it was a, yeah. a bag of uh, flour. Yeah, <laughs> I do this because Peter has got more back problems at times, so he always says... Yeah, but it's a sizable weight, it's, a, it's a, even for the fact that you were doing it at all, rather than no. doing it in two stages, <laughs> was quite impressive. I see there's weight training. So yes, uh, we do not advocate particularly hitchhiking. I think it's, nowadays it's kind of frowned upon. I think a lot of you will remember in the old days when it was quite common. And actually I think like a, like a lot of things, most of the time it's a good experience, I think. Yes, because you meet the local people, you talk, you talk with them, with them you, learn, you learn a lot. Yeah. They got very open and honest about their lives. Yeah, that's nice. And you get, so you get to sort of almost make short-term friends, people that you can chat to, yep. share Sometimes experiences. Sometimes long-term. Yep. Yeah. And then um, you're outside the supermarket, so then you can go in and buy some flour and Yeah, that's why I'm buying flour, lentils, beans, uh, and just some basics. Okay. And then I shop back. Back into the bush, and often I have to then walk another few hours to get to Peter in the tent. Yeah, and not walk a few hours across meadows and things. This was like across rivers and, and rocks. And some of the river crossing, some of the river comes up to here. Yeah. So I have to lift my uh, backpack up to not getting wet because if it's getting wet, you know, it takes ages to dry. And your flour is in there as well. Exactly, but I'll pack all that in, in special plastic bags yeah. and keep it all dry. And oh, so not environmentally friendly, then. Eh? <laughs> I've got a special way. So what I do is I buy all these stuff in the supermarket, then chuck it all out, all of it, um, all of these bags like this, and put it in our own bags. And it's amazing how much plastic I get rid of. And I give it back to the supermarket. That's good. Yeah, so you're not leaving no trace behind, not leaving plastic yeah. out in the world. No, oh, that would be terrible. Which we also feel is a, a really important thing. If you do go out traveling or, or camping or walking, don't leave rubbish behind you, it's so important, I think, we don't make a mess, I mean... It's just so ugly to look at, really. It's so ugly, and, and it can also be quite dangerous for animals, some animals can die, you know, with, you know, plastic bags and things in, in lakes and... Yeah, because sometimes, you know, if you have a tin, for instance, there's not a tin, but if you have a tin, and then a, a little wood hen, like a chicken, goes in there, puts its nose in there, and then can't get it out. Mm. And it just walks there endlessly when there's no in the tin. Because the tins, quite often when you when you open yeah, yeah, them, got a they have like a yeah. razor edge on the inside, so it's like barbs. It's hard for them to get out. Yeah. And I can tell you a funny story now of uh, my sheep. We used to keep sheep in France, one yes. of the things. And we've been going. We've gone to the supermarket to do a little bit of shopping. And we used to. Our sheep were fairly free range. They sort of roamed around the garden pretty freely. Right. Yeah. So um, one of our sheep called Poppy, she was particularly, oh no, it wasn't Poppy, it was Lily. She was particularly... It was uh, Waffle. Was it Waffle? It was Waffle. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so it was Waffle. She was particularly mischievous. She was always getting into anything that was left. So we left a watering can on uh, with a bit of water inside. Oh. She put her head inside, so this is where the story, she put her head yeah. around the, the loop on the watering can into the oh, watering can to disasters. drink some water. Yeah. And then she lifted her head up 
and the watering can was stuck. So a big green watering can. So we're driving back from the shops yeah. and I'm coming up the, we're, we live in a very remote part of the country so it's not like a lot of traffic, but I'm driving up the road and there's this sheep walking towards me with a watering can on its head. And it's like, <laughs> and it walked straight into the car. It, we, I stopped and I go, oh. it, it, she goes, clunk. I go, and we go, waffle. You stupid girl, you know, and trying to get her head out of the watering can. Yeah. And she's like, she walked quite a long distance, like hundreds of meters. And in the roads, the only traffic we had near us were tractors, so it wasn't really that oh, yeah. dangerous. Mm -hmm. But she must have been walking for maybe an hour with a watering can on her oh, head. Oh, did you make a YouTube out of her? No, back in those days, <laughs> we didn't even really have YouTube. But it was quite funny. You know, because she was, yeah. she sort of, we just... So that happens a lot in the wild, when yeah. you save your cans and all that. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. It's, it goes to say, I mean, it's funny in hindsight, because we see this sheep coming towards us with a green watering can, and it's our sheep, and we can save her and take her home. Yeah. But it's not nice for animals when they put their heads into those all this packaging we have. That's really interesting, you say, like, tin cans can be particularly unpleasant. Yeah. So, yeah. so don't leave your um oh, i've got a question i just got a lot of comments so oh. bill, bill farron says hi steve i just joined the stream what are you guys up to hey that, bill that oh we just ate it we have been this is what they're up to bill you've ate this but you're a bit too late but maybe you can sort of you can rewind, rewind. and watch it we made these lovely cookies with um some coconut flour and um miriam's just about to slice another piece so she can attest they are delicious. I would say a little more sugar for me. I would probably add a little more sugar. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. I think it's sweet enough. Okay. But, so, um... So Dwayne then says, Farmers and ranchers have done heavy lifting a lot. I agree. Hitchhiking is not safe these days. Too many scary people out there. That's yeah. right. And uh, Bill says, Five gallon water is around 19 kilos, which is 42 pounds. Um, uh, so more than that, the... the, the, the yeah, it was more than five gallons. More than five gallons. Yeah. Um, Dwayne says the plastic holders for cans can be trap be a trap for birds. They get caught in them in our oceans. There's so much plastic and garbage in it. That's not good. Well, um, which mm. we all agree with. Well, mm -hmm. then, still busy eating, and I'll carry on. So Gil says we'd love to see different supermarket tours around Australia if they would allow filming. And Byron says, hi, Michelle. Hi, Byron. Hi, Byron. And thank you very much. How are you? <laughs> Good to have you in. So I've got one question for the person who was watching. This question has been on my mind for years. So we go to the supermarket and um, they see all that food. And then on the back, they bring in new food. New thing. Big machines bring it all in. Now, how do they keep the rats? out of the supermarket? I have no idea. I'd like to post this question right now because well, I'm sure you are all very clever and you're very good at finding information. Yeah, because Maybe Steve knows it. I know a little bit actually about this because um, a lot of supermarkets do have rats in the supermarkets so you can... They do have them. I've, I've been in supermarkets. I've In the past I've I've been involved with supermarkets where I've been in the back, and they do have problems with rats. So there's a cost. There's a constant. Mm -hmm. There's a oh, constant yeah. um, fight against not just rats, but but mm -hmm. bugs. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so they caught mice. Quite, they, mice, rats, and, mm -hmm. and different parts of the world have stronger problems. You know, in mm -hmm. parts okay. of France, rural France. So what did they do? Yeah, so well, Bill's just said rats. They use poison and traps in markets. You see the traps in the back rooms. Yes, yeah, they have traps. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they have to trap them and they pay quite, they have to, they budget for people to come in to keep down the, the, the oh. rodents. But there is also, also uh, something a little bit maybe uh, that might concern you, and I, some, I don't know if this is true, so this is an FDA thing that I read in the US, <laughs> there is a certain amount of mouse droppings that's acceptable in human food, I think by the FDA, the, the Food and Drug Administration in the US, they say, there is a certain amount of mouse feces that's allowed in food before it's sick. Now, ah, so how many is a mouse in here, ladies and gentlemen? Maybe five, six no. mouse droppings? No, we don't let mouse droppings in. We don't know because it comes in the flour. No, we have, yeah, but we, we don't, we, no, I go through and take it out. 
Did you not see before I took <laughs> the mouse dropping down? I've never seen a mouse dropping in um, in the foes, but maybe you have. So have you seen any rat shit? If you have anyone seen any rat shit in well, there? Excuse me, this is a family friendly show. <laughs> Feces. Feces. Uh, so. So any small little droppings, you always wonder what what. Solon said it, it's Dave, and Shelley's still sleeping. Uh, just, just clarifying that. Dave, um. If you get a chance to have a look at Miriam's YouTube's channel, which she has, it's uh, Miriam Lanswood on your YouTube channel? No. You can see this lovely lady singing. She's got a wonderful voice and she plays lovely guitar. And I think actually Shirley would like what she does. It's uh, very talented. But, so, so, Gil says, moving hints, don't use produce boxes to move, use meat boxes. They were kept refrigerated, frozen in the back. Way less bucks. Okay. Now, um, huh. we sometimes used to get um, in our farm, when we had our own, we used to keep all our own grain and things, so we had mm -hmm. big vats of grain, and we used to grind our own flour. We were like the Walton, Waltons, you know? Yeah. Um, we sometimes used to get weevils in, in uh, yeah, the flour, yeah. because it's, it's, it's very difficult to keep uh, weevils out of flour, yeah. and they would be, you know, in your, in your different grains, yeah, quite common. Quite common. In the past, it would have been always like that. And, and it would be just ground. <coughs> when they're still in the pupae state, they would be just ground into the flower. Yeah. So, so Lulu's robot streamer says that's gross. Do you guys watch Jackal? Jackal? Sounds like Jackal? Whatever Jackal is? No. Uh, <laughs> Miriam actually watches nothing because she's had no, no phone, no internet, no... Cool. So we left civilization in 2010, and since then we have not seen any machine. Really, we did not live with any machine of any kind, so we have not watched anything, and so we've all missed it. So have we missed anything that is worth watching? Is yeah. my question. Okay, so if you have some good suggestions in the last ten years, almost. No, yeah. because so I'm now another three days in civilization. So if I missed anything, please tell me. She wants to catch up. She wants to binge um, no. watch everything. Yeah. Because um, if it's worth watching, I will watch it. I so think if you it have any suggestions for some good shows that uh, Miriam and Peter might... Because actually at some point next year they will be settling down in um, uh, New Zealand for a short stop. So they might have an opportunity, maybe a, a, a few weeks, month or so, to watch some... To watch you never some, know never when, know. Um, how long we're going to stay. We don't plan too much, but... No, um, it's never to say. If you, you say there's something worth watching, of any kind, a series, a movie, whatever it is, please tell me, because I've not seen any television or series since 2010. And Michelle and I have been traveling for four years, so we missed a lot of stuff. We have caught, I recommended one or two to you. I won't say what they are because the audience might come up with some other suggestions yeah. of good TV uh, or good television shows or maybe some films that you've enjoyed uh, that are worth watching. Mm -hmm. I mean, 10 years is yeah. a pretty big chunk of time. Yeah. Dwayne says, mouse or rodent feces can make people definitely ill. We have no rats where I live, but we have plenty of mice. Yeah, can the audience hear the question mark? No yes, okay. yes, from they can see it also. Oh, they can see it's it, it's okay, great. Yeah, yeah. So Dwayne's comments go up and, and the people yeah. watching this can see oh, it. Oh yeah, fantastic, of course. Yeah. Now, um, where we lived in France, when the harvest came, mm -hmm. we used to, the, the harvest, the big combine harvesters around us in all the fields, yeah. um, uh, it, it upset a lot of the field mice and the yeah. shrews and everything. So they used to come into the house. So we had hundreds oh. of little mice. Oh yeah, yeah, they were coming in the house, in the, because and they used to come to get out of the cold. And I like mice and shrews. Yeah. A little secret of mine. I, I, I like them. I think they're great. Yeah. Uh, they're quite cute to look at, but absolutely impossible to live with. Oh, they make a mess. Yeah. Unfortunately, they don't know where to go to the toilet. They don't sort of pop outside and go to the toilet. You can't put a little mouse flap in your door for them to go out. Yeah. If they could do that we could coexist with them very comfortably. Yeah. What they do instead is they take everything from your house, packaging, bags, they any clothing they can I've seen find. the damage what rats have done in hearts and in houses. Mice can do it, even a little mouse. Unbelievable. Yeah. And they take everything, they take bits of clothing, bits of bag, anything, and they make nests. But they don't, they're not happy with a little nest just for one little mouse. They need huge nests and they, they no. urinate in the nest, so they smell 
and it's, it's terrible. massive. Yeah. So it's not a good thing. But I do like mice. Despite that, I still love mice, and 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 I even quite like rats. Oh. Yeah. So who of all the people watching has ever eaten a rat? Because I know in Thailand they eat yeah. rats, right? Is it, I. Get this? They do. Yeah, they do quite often. Yeah. Uh, so we they, never actually done it. We've eaten just about anything else, but not never rats. I would. And, um, I would eat rats. I have no problem with that. Oh, would eat it too. But I would like to know who is who's watching and who's eating it and if it's nice um i'm trying to think if i have i don't think i've eaten rat and some i know that sounds crazy that i might not know if i've eaten rat but <laughs> i've eaten a lot of things in southeast asia that i'm not sure what i'm eating no never know. and uh um you often see if you're driving in some parts of rural thailand even in cambodia and places like that you will see on the side of the road uh near the fields they're selling mm -hmm barbecued rats. Rats. Uh, Tail and everything? Uh, on a, on a, on a, on a uh, like a spit open like this, on a, on a, yeah, cooked on a stick. <laughs> so I saw a lot of comments right there. So uh, Bill Farron says, um, I have eaten a few, not many rats though. <laughs> and and um, Gil says, in the US people eat squirrels, sort of ratish, I suppose. Yeah, I mean a squirrel. Have you had squirrel in no. New Zealand? No, it's not like a rat. Oh, I guess. It is a, a, a very close, it's a, yeah. I think it's classified as a rodent. Yeah, I guess. Um, and a very, I mean, certainly my ancestors in England would have eaten a lot of squirrels because yeah. they're very common. You food. see them a lot, but there's no squirrels in New Zealand. So we saw them a lot in um, Bulgaria and in France and that, but not in New Zealand. Yeah. When he says cats and snakes are great for getting mice and rats under control, Siamese yeah. cats were put on ships to fend them off. I did not eat rats, I heard they do in Thailand, they deep fry them. No, they deep fry them. No. They deep fry them, they barbecue them, they use them in stews and things like that, so they, they're quite quite common. Yeah. Um, Gil says, do you use rat tails for toothpicks? Long. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's a good joke. <laughs> and Bill said, it I hate it. Too hard. I have No, uh, but you do use um, rat whiskers for flossing, right? <laughs> <laughs> flossing, no, we use just twigs to clean our teeth. But sometimes, every now and then, Peter gets into the, the fire and uses the ash and the charcoal to put on his teeth. And it looks very weird. He never warns me like that. And he always, for some reason, always looks up and it looks very black. It's always sort of a scary sight. But that really cleans the teeth. Yeah. Yeah, charcoal is very good for that. And, and actually, know. a lot of the original toothpaste used to have a lot of charcoal and salt in them. Yeah. So actually, when you travel, sorry to hijack that story a little bit but when we when you travel in Southeast Asia a lot they still sell a lot of salty toothpastes. Have you had that yeah. before? I've had salty yeah. toothpaste years ago. So but, yeah. you get this you if you buy say in uh, in Thailand sometimes in Malaysia in the Philippines and you buy a toothpaste and you think we're always used to having minty flavours you know yeah. and you put it in and your mouth just salt. and it's just salt. And, and I guess it's kind of good. Yeah, and during the war in the in the nineteen forties, and people were, couldn't have access to um, toothpaste, they used salt to clean their yeah. teeth. Yeah. So quite often, I remember a lot of people talking in the old days about using a toothbrush with salt to clean their teeth. And charcoal has a similar sort of uh, it's active carbon, which is, is yeah, yeah. So it would be good. Yeah. But it would look pretty. Uh, so he looked up, and it's like black. Well, it's black. Yeah. And brown and dark grey, I'm guessing. No, really black. black. <laughs> Obviously, then he rinses his out and then he just brushes it because it'll be also got normal toothbrush. Obviously. So you just do it like that. But it, it works really well. Yeah. Mm. So going back to the rats, Bill Farron said, I hate it. I ate it once, but it's not very nice at all. No? Was it cooked properly, though? Or was it, was it like half raw, maybe? <laughs> and um, Bill said, I've used mistat mis sticks for teeth. Very interesting. What's that? Mistat. Mystique. 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 Can you Google that for us? What is a mystic? Um, not familiar. Dwayne said, did you try alligator or snake? They eat that in the southern US. Have you had snake? Or never alligator? had a snake. We traveled three months in New in Australia. We never saw one snake. Well, this is quite amazing because there's a lot of out there. What was the most unusual thing you think you ate? What would you think? Well, a lot of people don't eat possum in New Zealand. They would say that's, you know, barely dog food. So possum is a very unusual thing that we ate. 
Yeah. Um, uh, go to even. Not many people eat go to New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. Were there different varieties of possum? No, it's only the brush tail possum that is in New Zealand. Okay. Uh, I've heard in Australia there's lots of different possums, but... Um, yeah, we have uh, ring tails and sugar eaters. We have so yeah. many different possums. They only took the brush tail possum because they got a thickest fur and so they want to breed them up. So mm. They did that very successfully. Okay. Okay. Mistake, it was not a mistack, it was a miswack. Oh. <laughs> and it's a teeth cleaning oh, twig made from the Salvadorian persica tree, a traditional and um, it's from, from subcontinental Central Asia and Southeast Asia in Malaysia. Miswak is also known as something else. So miswak, so it's like a, a stick. Is it is it slightly uh, mentholated? Is it I, if it's a mentholated flavour? I think I. It's just a twig. It's a, yeah, I know yeah. it's a natural a natural wood, but I think I've seen that something like that. Yeah. Um, might be slightly different. Um, going way back to your TV programs, Gil said, what type of TV does Miriam like? Please, sci-fi, adventure, crime, oh, etc. I have no idea, because I haven't watched any television since 2010. So what would you recommend? I think one of the things you have to remember, Miriam started getting involved with this sort of lifestyle when she was quite young. So um, no, I was 26 when we moved into the wilderness, and I've been travelling for a lot of years before that, so I was sort of out of touch since 2004. Yeah, because you were probably <laughs> only about 21, 22 when you yeah. started traveling. A 20, a day after my birthday, and 20, after my 20 month birthday, I left Holland, and that's about it, really. So just make some, some suggestions if you have some things you might like, and maybe um, if you can think. Movies, series. Of the sort of things that uh, somebody of your disposition might enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> Miswak, you get rid of the outer bark and the inside splinters out like bristles. Oh, okay. okay. So like little brushes then, you could almost sort of brush your uh, teeth with it. Charcoal no, toothpaste seems to be all the rage in the US lately. Oh, uh, charcoal my, toothpaste. Yeah, and my toothbrush from, that I use at the moment is a carbon activated toothbrush. From, in, when, when you go to um, Thailand or yeah. Southeast Asia, many countries, they sell black toothbrushes. So they're, Often, oh yeah, so the bristles are black, carbonate. They, oh, they have carbon, okay. and they're really nice, uh, sort of um, very fine, very fine fibres. Mm. So they're good for your teeth, I think. I hope so, anyway. Yeah. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. I'm probably. Do you think it's time we maybe say goodbye? Yes, maybe we say goodbye. I'll wait. Uh, if you have any movies and things I should watch, just put post it and I'll read it afterwards because it's quite late right now. Uh, Tomorrow I'll fly to Sydney for the next event, um, School of Life, in Sydney um, on Tuesday. And I, I really urge if there's any of you out there that really like a good book, a good read, and I think this is a ridiculously inexpensive book as well. I think it's about... Becoming a, a Truman Show. Well, it's good value. So this book here, <laughs> I'll come around and show you. <laughs> it's called Woman in the Wilderness. So my name is Miriam Lanswood, and there's a lot of stuff on the YouTube. So here is and the book again. If you read a book, and if you can't read English, try Chinese or German Is that or the French. verse? No, it's the right way, I think. So it's Woman in the right. Wilderness, Miriam Lanswood. Uh, my Story of Love survival and self-discovery so this is also a little bit about you and peter and the way that you no, it's about relationship open relationships uh it's about survival it's about you know insight we had we had there it's about society this is miriam and peter sat out in the wilderness there's uh, i will say this uh, uh just let me come back around so Peter's an old, older than I am. I am uh, at the moment 35 and Peter is 65. So I was going to say, there's difference. quite an age difference between the two of you. Uh, yeah, 30 I years mentioned that before. Difference. Yeah, so we call that an intergenerational relationship because that's what it is. We know, learn a lot from each other. But they have a very similar spirit, I think, a very similar spirit inside you, I think. So it's kind yeah, of, it's more that. to do with the, um, they, they certainly just seem to get on very well mm -hmm. and uh, check out the book if you want a good read i think it's also available for download from amazon um, oh it's also an audiobook and an ebook yeah if you like listening yeah 
Yeah, so a lot of people like them, huh? Yeah, a lot of people really like car? audiobooks. Or when you do long walking or a lot of cycling? Or? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it's not Miriam's dulcet tones reading that out. It's been done by somebody far more eloquent than Miriam. <laughs> somebody somebody in, in Britain. And I think and somebody in Australia. would have been nice to have that lovely and somebody uh, in Holland. Dutch New Zealand accent. But really? No. Yeah, I think so. No, 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 this will be far better. So, uh, we'll leave a link down below this video uh, if you want to get hold of a copy of Miriam's book. Yeah. It's already below the video. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get a copy of the book, uh, now, to be honest, uh, I don't think Miriam makes a great deal of money or when you, you sell the books. No. So um, Just get it in the library. Just, just <laughs> But Saves you a lot of money. So don't worry about we're not she's not but I say no. get a copy for yourself. No, it's good, but if you if you like books No, but you can buy it as a prison or something, but just for yourself, just get it in the library or just an e book. Saves a lot of money. Don't don't do it for me. <laughs> don't do it for me. If you enjoy a good read, uh, yeah. at the very least get it on your Kindle or download it for, for reading it. Uh, and now at least you've met the the, the lovely lady that that wrote the book yeah, and the e -net. you yeah. uh, understand a little bit about their adventure and I think um, next week maybe I'll be putting up a video on my own channel uh, which will introduce you to Peter and Miriam out in the wild when we were cooking together um, so we see a little example of Peter's cooking uh, yes, that's right. in the kettle yeah, oven. Yeah, beautiful um, yeah. Uh, be great fun. vegetarian curry strangely enough yeah. And um, so I look forward to that. And if we get an opportunity also, we might share some of the uh, presentation that Miriam did uh, on your research. In Melbourne, last Thursday, yeah. on the 25th of October. Now, Miriam, we have, I think, some of the best viewers in the world out there. The, my YouTube followers are fantastic really? people. So. I just want to thank them for joining us today and yes, and thank you so much for watching with us. Yeah. And I know a lot of you will be watching this after the event. So um, love to you all. Comments and get across also to Miriam's channel. I'll, I'll leave a link down below so you can subscribe. She's not. Remember, this is not a lady that spends a lot of time on the internet so don't leave comments and expect to get replies very quickly but, but if you want to contact me you can do via the website miriamlanswood.wordpress.com and if you just go to contact it goes straight to my inbox yes so i will read it don't know when but straight to her inbox I will get to. she has no computer so it will take no. time but she will actually reply and i tell you another thing <laughs> miriam was talking about arranging some sort of wilderness um adventures for people oh so. yeah i wanted to uh, find other women who can hunt now do you know any woman out there in america or canada or in europe who can hunt because i'd like to go with her on an expedition an epic female expedition in new zealand starting already this january and uh, i'm asking you because i haven't found anyone yet uh, now it's possible that they may not be able to get in, uh, available in time for that expedition but yeah. I still urge you to make contact with Miriam because I think you'll do other expeditions. I will do like more this. expeditions in yeah. the future but I've found heaps and heaps of women who are keen and they're very wild at heart and really love to come to survival but they can't hunt so if you know any hunters please contact me by the website and um, then I can talk to this yeah and woman. if any of you watch other channels I know dear meat for dinner a, a great YouTube channel a friend of ours who, who has a great channel out there uh, if you know anybody out there that would be interested in doing something like that well, put them in touch Gil says Miriam should check out Joe Rogan's YouTube channel he did interview women hunters ah and Ray says hunters. ask survival Lily and see what happens look at her channel she's in Europe oh, yeah okay. I know about her survival yeah. Lily you know yeah okay mm -hmm. And Joe Rogan I, I, has a lot of uh, great people on. Uh, that would be a fun thing to do. But I, I, you know, they're also very. You have a lot of things planned as well. So. Yeah. So in the future, I will organise more workshops, more expeditions. If you know anyone or yourself who is interested in survival, hunting, all that, especially if you're women, if you're a woman, please contact me because there will be something in New Zealand in the future. See, I wanted to go, but I'm. Clearly not woman, she wouldn't let me come. So if you, any of you gent, gentlemen out there that want to go on this track, you can't. Maybe next, next time. time.
Yes. Peter and Maureen will set up something that us guys can go to and... and oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So that could happen in the future. Um, in the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed a little bit of cooking today, making some cookies. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get a chance to make them, have some fun. Experiment with the sugars. We use brown sugar today. Uh, you could use honey, as somebody suggested earlier in the comments. Um, you could use any sweetener really you like, and you could use any yep. combination of uh, flowers. Yep. So, uh, unfortunately we don't have an off button. I have to go around the counter and press the finish button, so I'll get a lovely assistance machine. Oh no, I'll come and do it. I don't know where it is. You don't know where it is. <laughs> any last comments before we go? Um, well, people were saying, Brian, Dwayne said this was a great live chat. Um, Dwayne says, for films, what do you think of Crocodile Dundee? Captain Dwight says, good morning. Oh, thank you, Crocodile Dundee. And he said, this is a knife. Yeah. yeah, but I think that was prior. I never saw the film, one. I just know that comment. Yes, I think that possibly was even earlier than before. I think that was pre-2010, actually. I think that was probably... Yeah. I've never seen the film, but I will. Yes. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for watching. Thank you, everybody. Now we are going to say cheerio. I'm going to put my glasses on so good I can night see. and good morning. Good night, good morning. Well, you're not because you've got things there. How professional, how professional is this? <laughs> Night all, be good. There is a stop button up here somewhere. It's, it's underneath my massive possum microphone. Yeah. Say goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching.